So I'm hoping that this is going to be an exciting day, but I'm also certain that it's also going to be a moving day for a lot of us in this room. I'm asking that you show the utmost respect to those that are about to testify and tell their story, their experience. And in some ways, that's them telling our story and sharing our experiences. And I also ask that you show the utmost respect to this commission. They came because they care, because they know there's a crisis in our correctional system. So if you can, I'd like you to just silence your phones. And just appreciate what's about to take place. Over the last three days, we've all shared a lot of experiences and, um, and we've celebrated each other and we've honored those among us that go above and beyond the duty. And now this is the last day of three where we're going to be able to hear some very challenging things. And, and we're faced with some very challenging things. And we can't just have uh, people testify and think that that's all going to be fixed because it's not. When we leave here today, I want folks to go back and think about how we make real change. How do we take a system that's just broken for everyone that comes into contact with it. What do we do with that? It shouldn't just stop when everybody leaves that door. So I ask that you just ponder and think about what's possible. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Simon Greer, our moderator, and he's going to get us started. Thanks everybody for coming, I really appreciate it. And uh, Simon, here you go. Should we embarrass Andy with a big round of applause? Good morning, everybody. Um, I have the honor of moderating this first ever Blue Ribbon Commission, and I'm looking for anyone who wants to claim there has been a Blue Ribbon Commission on Correctional Wellness before, because I don't think so. So. Um, we, have, we have a couple of a few hours together this morning, and some people are asking why we're here, and I'm not going to belabor the point with all the statistics in the world, but I will start with a few that set the context for this. So we know that on average, corrections officers three a week take their own lives. We know that corrections officers suffer with a 34% PTSD rate, higher than any other profession in the United States. And the statistic that stays with me, and if you, you leave with no other numerical takeaway from today, is that corrections officers uh, have a life expectancy of about 59 years, as compared to about 75 years for the average American, which means you sacrifice about 15 years of life expectancy just because you go to work in corrections. Now, corrections officers will tell you, and many of them are here today, like, we know we, what we signed up for. It's a tough job. We get that. But no one said that you'd have to give up 15 years off your life for making this your career, and that shouldn't be. And so, in short, that's why we're doing this commission. Right? That's a crisis. It, we wouldn't let it stand in any other sector. Right? We would say, that's a, we gotta do something. And for some reason, we haven't figured out what to do. And so, we could have had this meeting among 20 of us, 50 of us, 100 of us, who all agree about everything. We could talk to ourselves, talk to each other, and say, this is terrible. Isn't it terrible? I agree it's terrible. You think it's terrible? Yeah. And all those people who don't think it's terrible, they're terrible too. Right? Which is kind of what we do these days. Right? Find the people who agree with me, get together, talk trash about the other people, and be happy that we're right. So our idea was let's not do that. Let's do something different. Let's bring together a cast of characters up here who do not agree on everything. <laughs> they may disagree fundamentally about some things. And the, everyone in the audience and all the testifiers and all of the commissioners don't all agree. But wouldn't that be novel? That we could get together and say, we disagree about a lot of things, but the 15 years that corrections officers are giving up on their lives, we can agree that that shouldn't go on. 
and we can agree to do something about it. And maybe if this diverse a crowd of people with this many different perspectives could agree that that's a crisis that can't go unaddressed, maybe we could actually do something about it. So that's why we're having the commission. Now, because of the, it's easy to say, well, we want people from a lot of different backgrounds. It's, it's harder to do because we all have different language. We have different life experience. We have different perspectives. So I just want to ask everyone, like, take a deep breath and prepare to offer each, offer each other some grace. Someone is going to use a word that you're like, they called us guards. Can you believe it again with us being called guards? And yeah, fair enough. Later, you'll grab them and be like, we actually like corrections officer, not guard. Right? And you can talk about that. Or someone's going to say inmate. And someone's going to be like, we don't use that word. Right? We say incarcerated individual. But some people use the word inmate. Right? And our job here is not to pretend that those differences don't exist. Over time and in the context of relationships, we believe that you can talk to someone and say, this is why the language matters to me. This is why those words matter. But the assumption isn't that we're all on the same page with the same language, the same training, the same background, the same life experience. We have differences. But that's what makes change possible because we can cross our differences to solve our pressing problem. So hopefully you'll extend a little grace to each other. Um, and I think we'll get started. All right, so I'm going to uh, introduce, or I'm going to give the commissioners an opportunity to introduce themselves. We'll start with Ken down on the end there, and they'll pass the mic along just to say a quick uh, your name and affiliation. Ken Daly, CEO, Guardian RFID. Good morning, uh, David Pitts, Urban Institute Senior Research Fellow. Darielle Kennedy, President of the Student Body at Oberlin College. Brianna Newfer, Vice President for Criminal Justice Reform at Stand Together. Uh, Reverend Terrence Melvin, the uh, President of the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists and Executive Director for the AFL-CIO Racial Justice Task Force. Amanda Ripley, I'm a journalist who writes about conflict. Dr. Nika Jones-Tapia, Managing Director of Justice Initiatives at Chicago Beyond. Simon Greer. Mary Kay Henry, President of the Service Employees International Union. Rob English, Senior Organizer with the Industrial Areas Foundation. Good morning, Julie James, Vice President of Criminal Justice at Arnold Ventures. I'm David Safavian. I'm the General Counsel for the American Conservative Union, and I'm the Director of the Nolan Center for Justice at the American Conservative Union Foundation. Uh, Juan Gomez, Executive Director and Co-Founder at Milpa. I'm part of the Cahuitec Nation out in Texas, Northern Mexico. Good morning, Rabbi Jonah Pesner, Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism. Will you join me in welcoming the commissioners and giving them a round of applause? I'm going to invite our first panel of testifiers to come up and join us. So I invite Stephen Walker, William Young. Uh, Millie Brown is not here today with us, but her colleague Tara Keaton will be offering her testimony, and Brianna Mellon. This first panel, uh, entitled I'm Not Okay, will share with you firsthand accounts from retired and current uh, correctional staff and family members um, who all have firsthand experience with what it's like to work in and live in and around corrections. For far too long, the culture in corrections has been, you just, you just suck it up. You don't talk about it. Or maybe you tell war stories to kind of blow off steam, but to really tell your story firsthand and convey the impact that this life experience, this work experience has had on you is something we've done far too little. A lot of corrections officers will tell you and I know some of them, they'll say, I don't want to talk about that. Right? I, don't want to, I don't want to share that. I, I, I'll take care of it myself. This is uh, a brave, brave move by all four of you to be here today and to share your experience with the commission. I know the commissioners and the audience are super eager to hear from you. We know this is a career and a profession that has been overlooked and undervalued, and this is a chance for us to begin to turn that ship around. So with that, I'm going to ask Stefan Walker to speak first. Morning, commissioners. Wellness is preventative care. Forewarned, armed. The question is, armed against what? 
I imagine that the prevention for a prep cook is fundamentally different than the prevention for a chainsaw logger. So therefore, meaningful reform, meaningful prevention requires context. A need for research and understanding. To that point, I contend that we as a society endorse the intentional purpose and design of prison, creating a context of an environment of punishment. With that, I'd like to pose a question to you. But first, looking at the credentials, the experience and insight in this room, and recognizing that for all of our work, study, and insight, the complexities of the impact of prison are so vast and imperceptible that it will require our combined continued meditation and and vetting for resolution. So my question is, how could a single correctional officer be expected to process an environment and not I'm sorry. how can a single correctional officer be expected to understand and process an environment that doesn't differentiate and when it is real to them they're most likely in crisis and questioning everything including their own thoughts. So I can tell you that the Correctional Crisis Centrifuge is debilitating. My name is Stephen Walker. I raise the issue of experience, insight, and crisis. My 35 years as an officer has vested a little of all of that in me. For context, I've been fired, suspended, assaulted, gassed, tased, intervened in fights, stabbings, riots. I've seen loss of life. I almost lost my wife, my family, and myself. As a union advocate, I band-aided the unidentified and misdiagnosed effects of stress, trauma, and crisis in myself and in my fellow officers. But for the last 12 years, mission one has been trying to find other individuals to help us raise the awareness of the impact of the correctional environment on people. That's why I'm here today, wellness. I believe that there are three issues that must be addressed in order to accomplish any sustainable or effective program. The first is contextual understanding. The second is a recognition of humanity. The third is collaboratively developed research-based educational services. So to the next, for the next few minutes, we're gonna get deeper into the challenge. And that challenge is preventing and mitigating the undisclosed and under-acknowledged harm the intentional design and operations of prisons perpetuates. See, we all know there is a problem, but until recently, the fault of that failure fell at the feet of the individual officer. Again, context, may I ask, does anyone in here know anyone that wants to go to prison? Now, of why and in that why the why not apply that to the psyche of a correctional officer that actually does every single day to the tune of about 2,088 hours in a year again context if you sleep eight hours a day throughout a year that's 2,920 hours it's time to shine some light into the subconscious closet of society and acknowledge that the purpose and intention of prison is punishment. And from that, 
is an environment that is anomalous to our societal structure, how we choose to live and engage with one another. It is also an environment that, that is essentially a minefield of fear, desperation, distrust, and uncertainty. So until we can change prisons, what suffers is our combined humanity. And at the leading edge of that humanity is the correctional officer. In that, look, our officers come with good intentions. They come to satisfy basic necessities, food, shelter, clothing, Disney Plus. <laughs> And to be self-sufficient, to get out, out of our parents' households. But we also come as, to be a contribution, to serve with honor. And in that service comes laden with humanity, a humanity that represents sometimes as a fallacy of perfection that's developed and, and or exacerbated by our academy process and our hiring process. We develop this black or white mentality, this us versus them, which leads unfortunately to cognitive dissonance. See, we develop this fault, this, this perception that fault or failure is seen as an assault on our sense of identity. And we believe that any admittance of weakness is a failure that could cost us everything. So all of our questioning thoughts, feelings, and belief, we actively compress down underneath things like, oh, you can't handle it? Oh, ain't no crying, toughen up. Or only crazy people need counseling. And the silent one that most of us don't know exist as ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, which are probably burning underneath each and every one of us, which makes the next point, education so vital. Agencies must have a pre-genesis through exodus, awareness and responsibility to the holistic well-being of its employees. They must intentionally but sagaciously dispel the stigma surrounding self-care. And within themselves, they have to acknowledge that there are inherent mental and behavioral health dangers that arise out of this environment. And additionally, acknowledge that the entry level knowledge, skills, and ability that they intentionally hire through are probably insufficient to self-care in this environment. Unfortunately, since we're not starting from scratch, we're going to have to build this on the fly. And the two engines of propulsion are research and education. And that's going to require partnerships because we, as corrections, have to acknowledge that the silos and the walls that we operate within and behind got us here. And the mental and behavioral health is not our strength. So agencies must reach out to academia and mental and behavioral health organizations and work in concert to evaluate the health and the harms of systems on people and use that same energy that they use for hiring and screening to make sure that we're healthy and disciplined when we're injured and apply that to prevention and mitigation. And a key component of that has to be coordination, not control. They, act, they have to actively listen and engage and echo back for validation that what we hear, but without judgment, seek, or seeking ways to impose and then evaluate with mental and behavioral health practitioners and develop cross assessments and process back with, our, with the staff before you operationalize it and, de and, and develop assistive follow through, not enforcement. See, this is prevention and in prevention, we normalize our conversations about how the dis-ease of this environment 
generated in us isn't happening to you. Now, the choices are not simple, but they are clear. This is a challenge, Rabbi. <laughs> Acts chapter 16, verse 26 through 28. I asked you, will you cry out and say we are here? We can continue as we have since around 62 AD, this system-centered trajectory, or we can recognize there are human beings with feelings, frailties, and good intentions and take a chance on developing services that heed and protect humanity. Now, knowing that my time is running out, I conclude with we need acknowledgement that this environment of prison is deleterious to the impact of humanity, which is going to require coordinated partnerships, research, intentionally developed services and support for people. I know it's going to be psychically numbing, but we ask you not to give up on us. Together, we can create meaningful prevention against the impacts of the prison environment in closing, I offer the assertion of the World Health Organization that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of infirmity. And I have 43 seconds. I had an epiphany as I was walking back in the rain. I didn't, it wasn't raining when I left. You can be in the rain, and the rain doesn't care if you're a correctional officer or an incarcerated individual. It's going to soak you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. We're going to move on to William Young. Good morning. It's an incredible honor and privilege to speak with you today at our nation's capital on behalf of the hundreds of thousands of brave men and women who selflessly serve their communities behind the walls and wire of the world's correctional facilities. Their dedication, their sacrifice, their struggles, and their strengths deserve to be recognized and rewarded, and I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to publicly praise their efforts and officially on the record regard them as heroes. Commissioners, my name is William Young and I've been a correctional officer for 17 years. I'm, a, I'm the author of two books, and in both books I address and share examples of how this profession has negatively impacted my personal life outside of, out of uniform. I also host a podcast and create correctional content on YouTube with the intention of providing relevant and relatable information to current retired, retiring, or aspiring correctional officers with a focus on highlighting the emotional damage and psychological dangers that officers can incur from prolonged exposure to the correctional environment. I appreciate you being here today and your willingness to entertain my testimony. Shortly after I published my first book, I received a message through Facebook. And this message, this communication became a moment that I'll never forget. This message, this moment became a sobering source of motivation, reinforcing the importance of making the mental health and wellness of correctional officers a priority. On Thursday, January 23rd, 2020, I was in my studio pretending to be productive when my phone vibrated. It was another message. I felt a flood of excitement rush through my body as my brain hit me with a tiny dose of dopamine. I love getting messages and interacting and engaging with the audience. I value their thoughts, their opinion, and their feedback, and I'm so appreciative when they take time and reach out. Anticipating praise for my latest project, I grabbed my phone and flipped it over to see who had messaged me. I opened up the message and had to stop reading it almost immediately. Seven words into it, my throat tightened and my eyes began to well up. Those first seven words were, I recently lost my husband to suicide. This was not, hey, I read your book and it was awesome, or how do I get a signed copy sent to me in Australia type of message. This was different. This was real. This was one of my absolute worst nightmares coming to fruition on my phone. Commissioners, have you ever had one of those moments where time stops and the silence of your surroundings becomes unbearable? A moment when you realize that you're in way over your head a moment that you can't find the words to adequately describe how you feel because you can't feel a thing. This was that. Frozen with fear and floating in my own head, I continued to read. The message read, I, lost, I recently lost my husband to suicide. He was a correctional officer seeking help for correctional fatigue. 
The author of this message went on to say that her husband had been having some troubles at his facility and that he had run into some situations that he wasn't sure how to deal with. She had spoken, he had spoken to the management in search of a solution, but instead of receiving help, he was reassigned to another area of the facility to work with a lower custody level. There he patiently waited for help, for treatment, for support, or, or something. And that move, that change of atmosphere helped a little for a while, but unfortunately the reality is major injuries, serious symptoms of anxiety and depression rarely subside on their own overnight. We can't just miraculously mend ourselves emotionally, regenerating missing pieces like a starfish. It became clear to me that, that her husband was fighting two different wars on two different fronts. On one hand, he was wrestling with whatever had changed him, damaged him, whatever had affected him to the point that he realized he couldn't carry the weight of it by himself. And on the other hand, he was battling the stigma that surrounds correctional officers when they reach out for help. I want to unpack that last paragraph so you understand what we're dealing with as we move forward with the conversation of emotional and psychological impact of working in this profession. As officers, we are trained very well to do the job. We are shown how to handle the seizures and the stabbings and the searches. We are taught CPR, first aid, tactical handcuffing, and verbal judo. We are shown where to stand when we are talking with an inmate and how to extinguish a fire by pulling, aiming, squeezing, and sweeping. Hours of instruction are given by dedicated professionals in an attempt to prepare us for the things we'll encounter inside on shift. But where we lack as a profession is providing information and resources to staff about the emotional impact that responding to a medical injury, excuse me, medical emergency or severe assault or an attempted or completed suicide can have on an officer. We aren't told these events will forever change us, so when they do, when the nightmares come, when the self-isolation and unwarranted agitation alter the way we interact with people off duty, we're caught off guard. We're left fighting an enemy that we didn't even know existed, a threat we didn't even know we were facing. Sun Tzu, a Chinese general military strategist and the art of war wrote, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. And that's the problem. We don't know our enemy. We think that the enemy is the population that we supervise, when in reality, the enemy is the correctional environment in its entirety. Our enemy isn't just the fights and the felons, it's the culture. It's the colorless, cold, and unforgiving concrete that confines not only the incarcerated, but us as well. The tragedy is that by the time the husband of the woman who sent this message to me understood what was happening to him, he felt like it was too late. The enemy of the correctional environment had successfully snuck up on him, rendering him defenseless. In desperation, he reached out to a fellow correctional officer. Now, a civilian or someone unfamiliar with the correctional career field may overlook the importance of him asking for help. An outsider may not understand the strength that it took for him to admit that there was a problem. Because in most professions, admitting that you're scared or stressed or that you have concerns within that certain aspect of the job isn't a big deal. Outside in other industries, speaking to others about anxiety or depression isn't career-ending conversation, but inside, in corrections, it can be. See, there's this little thing called stigma that scares the crap out of people that work in correctional profession. And stigma, in case you're not familiar, is, according to the Oxford Language Dictionary, a mark of disgrace associated with a particular circumstance, quality, or person. The woman wrote in her message that her husband had reached out to a coworker despite that stigma, despite the risk of appearing weak, despite the shame, the disgrace, and the dishonor that he could have been subjected to. Despite the danger, he reached out and asked for help. And she went on to say that the officer that she had reached out with was familiar with my mission and gave him a copy of my book. She said that her husband took the book, brought it home, and read it cover to cover, and after finishing the book, he gave it to his wife and asked her to read it. He was once again reaching out. By giving the book to his wife to read, he was saying that he could relate, and it was him saying that he was hurting and that he needed help, that he wanted her to understand what he was going through. He needed her to know where his head was at. He told her that he felt like a monster and that he hated it. He told her that there's so much that he wanted to say and talk about, but he didn't feel like anyone would understand what he was going through. That's the stigma. She wanted to understand, wanted to help him, but he told her that he felt he was too far gone. Days after that conversation, an argument erupted between the two of them. She wrote him nine months pregnant with her first child, and when he would snap in a CO mode, he wasn't himself. 
She said that he had fixed a sandwich, and for some reason it angered him. It sent him into a rage. It invoked an emotional response that was so explosive, so over the top, that she didn't know what was happening. She said that her husband went into the bedroom and came back out with a gun in his hand, a gun that he had given to her for her birthday just a few months earlier. She wrote, he shot himself right in front of me. Commissioners, after reading this, I felt empty. I felt useless and confused. All I could do was hang my head. After consulting with my wife and conjuring up the courage, I called the woman and had a conversation with her about her husband. It was one of the co hardest conversations I've ever had to have, but I'm glad that I did. We talked about her husband and about her family, and she thanked me for writing my book. She told me that what I was doing mattered, and she said that, she was, that what I was doing was important, and that I needed to continue to reach out and to write and communicate with correctional officers, because there are those out there like her husband that are struggling, and maybe if we can catch them sooner, we can save them. And that's what I'm trying to do for her, for him, for us. Commissioners, these stories are not unique. They're not anomalous. Unfortunately, the testimonies that you'll hear today are the truth and reality of countless correctional officers across the globe. We are fighting an enemy that we didn't even know existed, a threat that we didn't know we were facing, and we need some help. And that's where you come in, through your offered ears, your open mind, and your willingness to participate in a conversation about a profession that is often unseen, you have already shown intention. You have already shown a semblance of support that is essential for us to push this movement forward, for us to finally receive the respect, the recognition, and the resources that we deserve. Commissioners, I'll leave you with this. Henry J. Bond wrote in his 1855 publication, A Handbook of Proverbs, that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And I agree. Without action, without follow through, intentions to address the mental health and wellness of correctional officers are meaningless. We need to act. Together we have the ability, the power to rescue, to salvage, to save the lives of correctional officers by creating a movement that challenges our current culture and cult can cultivate an environment where staff are comfortable to ask for help and are confident that they will find it. Thank you, William. Um, Tara? Good morning. Sorry. My name is Tara Key, and I'm speaking on behalf of my partner, Millie Brown, who was unfortunately able, unable to be here. Good morning, distinguished guests of the Blue Ribbon Commission. My name is Milagros Brown. I have 20 years with the Connecticut Department of Correction, currently serving as a lieutenant. I am a member of CSEA, SEIU Local 2001, and the president of the Correctional Supervisors Council. I became involved with the union almost from the beginning of my career when a coworker invited me and picked me up to attend a meeting. As time went on and I enjoyed helping others, I ran for election to be secretary on the executive board. I served in that capacity for two years. I was eventually promoted to lieutenant and joined the union, which represents approximately 500 members, consisting of lieutenants, captains, council supervisors, parole managers, and deputy wardens. I come to you today in reference to the detrimental impact that this job has on correctional employees' health, especially our mental health. The physical and mental consequences that result over the years working in this profession has already reached a severe point of crisis, which has only been intensified by the current pandemic. It is my hope that after providing you all with a greater understanding of the ways this work impacts our health, you could help to rise awareness around the need to develop programs and increase support for this workforce worldwide. Correctional employees work in a negative, a very negative setting, which takes a toll on our overall well-being. We are often required to work in voluntary overtime, meaning 16 hours straight, which can only allow for three to four hours of sleep in between shifts. The effect minimum sleep has on an individual can cause you to be exhausted driving to and from work, less alert on the job, as well as decrease family time, just to name a few things. It is also not uncommon to experience bodily fluids being thrown at you, which may come in contact with your face. In some instances, 
you may even be physically assaulted. The staff working in our nation's prisons and jails are largely hidden from the public eye, considered essential employees in some instances and non-essential in others, despite the fact that our work doesn't change. For example, this workforce was considered critical infrastructure personnel who went into no, known con, con, sorry, congregate settings where COVID-19 existed and performed their daily duties without hesitation. Telework was not an option as correctional facilities are operating 24-7, 365 days a year. With correctional employees suffering from high rates of PTSD, depression, and substance abuse under normal circumstances, it should come as no surprise that this workforce experienced even higher levels of stress during this time frame. The fear of contracting COVID on the job, bringing it home to a loved one, or knowing that the possibility existed that a family member passed away from COVID and you unknowingly gave it to them. This added stress, along with the day-to-day -day operations within a correctional facility, has a tremendous effect on all individuals, those both working and living in these facilities, and also impacts their loved ones. Prior to joining this union, the members were working in collaboration with the University of Connecticut to develop a program designed, for union, designed by union members. The idea was to implement a program that would begin to address ways to obtain overall better health for this workforce. The program was started due to the fact that too many funerals needed to be attended due to staff deaths. Too many staff deaths. The union wanted to find a way to promote a healthier lifestyle and help members retire a little bit each day. The first topic of discussion was sleeping in which an app was created to monitor how much sleep the members were getting on a weekly basis. We currently have one day of wellness training incorporated into our contract. This one day of training has its curriculum developed and presented by the members. Since implementation, we have discussion on topics as sleep, healthy eating tips, and mental health. Mental health is currently being discussed at this year's training, and it seems to be the most talked about with our members. I believe this program has the potential to have great success as it has been developed and taught by the members currently working in this job force. In closing, I would like to express my gratitude to all union leaders, mental health workers, administrators, and legislators who have helped to establish correctional staff wellness programs. But sadly, these are the exceptions, not the rule. And so I hope you can all join me in advocating strongly for the creation of programs and increased support for correctional employees and their families. Staff wellness programs should begin at the academy and continue through retirement. And all correctional facilities should include annual training on mental health and stress reduction coping skills for all active duty staff, including administrators. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here today about this important matter. Thank you. <laughs> Brianna, we'll come over to you. Good morning. Thank you all for taking the time to be here today. My family's story is something that I wish could say was rare, but unfortunately, tragedies like this affect corrections families far more than the general public realizes. August 25th, 2011, my mom and I had been staying at my aunt and uncle's house for a few weeks with the hopes that it would finally convince my father to get the help that he truly needed. I had just gotten back from shopping with friends when my phone started ringing. It was my brother. I answered, and the first words he said were, do you know why there are police and an ambulance at our house? A neighbor had just called him asking if we were okay. Knowing the state that my father was in, I knew things instantly were not okay. I got into my car and drove about 90 miles per hour through our small town. I turned the corner onto our street and I saw our house surrounded by yellow tape, every cop car in town, and an ambulance in our driveway. I ran under the yellow tape and was practically tackled by a police officer. He asked me if I knew where my father would go if he was in trouble. 
I said I wasn't sure. They asked me if he owned any guns. I listed off what guns he owned, and I heard over the radio that they thought one was missing. I said, is my mom here? Is she okay? And all he said was, she's alive, which wasn't promising. They escorted me to a cruiser to answer some more questions, and then we went down to the station to answer some more questions. Finally, my brother and I insisted on going to the hospital to be with my mother. Flashback to a few hours before I got that phone call. My father had texted my mom to see if she could come by the house after work so they could talk. My mom agreed and went to the house and found him in the living room sitting on the couch. My father asked my mother if she was coming home, and she said, not until you agree to get help. He then took out the gun that he had hidden under his couch cushion. I won't go into too much detail on what happened next, but he knew what he was going to do and needed to stop my mom from interfering. A physical fight ensued, and once he was able to restrain her, he locked the doors and got into his car and drove. She had barely survived. On the road, he called 911 and reported that someone at our address needed medical attention. He then drove to a beach at a lake a few towns over, put his car in park, and shot himself in the head. My brother and I were at the hospital with my mom when a social worker took us into another room to tell us that they had found my dad and he had killed himself. I was 19 years old at the time, and my brother was 17. My father, Michael Mellon, retired a captain from Sousa Baranowski Supermax Prison in Massachusetts at the age of 45 after 22 years of working for the Department of Corrections. I had truly had the best childhood growing up. My parents really made sure that we had everything we needed to be happy and comfortable. Little did we know, our parents were sheltering us from a very dark world that my father experienced every day. He suffered from post-traumatic stress, depression, anxiety, and also battled an addiction with oxycodone. We weren't, until, we weren't aware until after he died that he was being prescribed enough oxycodone to sedate an elephant, as one doctor prescribed it. He was in this vicious cycle of being in mental and physical pain and then numbing the pain any way he could. The more pain he was in, the more he needed to numb until he was just an absolute shell of himself. One day he came home from work and told my mom that he could never go back to the prison again, and he actually never went back. During his time in retirement, he bounced around from job to job, trying to find his place in the world, but he struggled to find a workplace that valued his leadership and his experience um, in the prison as a supervisor. He only lived about 18 months after he retired. So I want to go back to the day that my dad died and talk about that critical moment where my mom said, only if you agree to get help. That didn't come out of nowhere. My mom had been begging him to get help for years. She was the only person who he showed even a little bit of himself to. She took care of him when he was going through withdrawals at the end of the month. She was constantly thinking of ways that my brother and I could try to cheer him up on his bad days. She really was the rock in our family. When she asked him to get help again in that August, when he was at his worst, she knew it was life or death. When they were sitting on the couch that day, her worst nightmare had come true. But what if by some miracle in that moment, he had agreed to get help? Where would we have even started? As a family, we were so ill-equipped to understand what my dad was going through and had no idea how to help him. I did not even understand, I didn't understand at the time what depression or PTSD meant. I barely even understood what my dad did for a living. My mom tried everything she had in her toolbox to try to help him, but unfortunately, we just did not have the right tools. He did agree to couple therapies at one point, but a few years before he died, but he refused to go back because he accused the therapist and my mom of conspiring against him. That was the last time he ever stepped foot inside a therapist's office. His extreme paranoia was at an all-time high and he trusted no one, and I know 22 years in corrections had a hand in that. The day of my dad's wake, my mom, brother, and I all stood next, next to my dad's casket and greeted everyone who came to pay their respects. Only two people from my dad's prison showed up, and one of them handed my mother, still bruised from fighting for her life, a pamphlet on officer wellness. She didn't even have the energy to comprehend what had just happened, but looking back, you see how absolutely broken a system must be for a representative, representative of the DOC to hand an officer's widow a pamphlet on officer wellness as they're standing next to his dead body. Where was this pamphlet when my dad first started the job? 
Where was this information when his coworkers, who he worked with almost 70 hours a week, started to see his mental health declining? The state managed to make a horrific situation even harder on our family of a man who dedicated his life to serving. A few, days, a few days after my dad's death, the state had issued his monthly retirement check automatically. Someone at the state realized that the check included the few days in August after my dad was declared dead, so they billed my mother for the rest of that extra money. So again, where would we have even started if he did agree to get help? Families need to be a part of this journey with their loved ones starting in the academy because negative effects of the job are inev inevitable. It's not if they're going to change, it's when they're going to change. Your loved one eventually might not be able to sit with their back to a door or a crowded room. Your loved one may lose interest in the things that used to bring them joy. They might isolate and refuse to talk about work. They may turn to drugs or alcohol to cope, and so on. But when they do start to change, the family needs to know what to look out for before it gets to that crisis point. I believe that it should start right in the academy. I co-founded a nonprofit when I was 20 for mental health awareness and suicide prevention for correction officers. One time, our co-founder Julie and my mom went to go speak at an, ev at an event for families of officers in the academy, which you think would be a great step in the right direction for what I was saying. Well, the sheriff's staff asked to see their speech and began censoring the things that they weren't allowed to say in front of the families as to not scare them. What they didn't realize was that the reality of this is scary. Our story is living proof of exactly how scary it can get. Correction suicide is happening at an alarming and unnoticeable rate. No matter how scary it is to talk about, families need to know what to look out for before their loved one gets to the crisis point like my dad was at. If you can catch the symptoms early on, it's much more easier to treat and much more manageable. If you were to give my family two options, one, attend a few real and transparent information and informational classes about job stress, mental health, and what to look out for in your loved one, or two, watch your loved one slowly fade away, which then culminates into a psychotic break and almost a murder-suicide, we would choose option one every single time. And I'm sure any family member of an officer would agree. My father was strong-willed, sarcastic, tough, and was the first person by your side if you needed help with anything. He showed up for everyone else but himself. I wish he had realized how much he meant to everyone around him, but I know who he was the day he died was not him anymore. Soon after he passed away, I started to re relate to how my father was feeling. In the aftermath of his suicide, I found myself also slipping away. I had so many unanswered questions after he died, mainly, why did he choose to leave us? Was it something I did or didn't do? Why weren't we good enough? Obviously, these were irrational thoughts, but ask any survivor of suicide and they will share these same inner thoughts. I know after 22 years in corrections and battling PTS, depression, addiction, he just wasn't my father anymore. But the unanswered questions just ate away at me. I often turned to alcohol as my primary coping mechanism, I was reckless with my life and truly thought for a while that I was not worthy of living. It wasn't until nine years and 11 months later after my dad took his own life that I was brave enough to finally ask for help. And I entered into a 30-day program in Utah to finally start addressing my own PTS, depression, and anxiety. My last day in Utah came just one week before the 10-year anniversary of my father's passing. During my time there, I was able to face many of the demons I was battling and was able to let go of some of the baggage I had been carrying that was not mine to carry. I finally felt like I could breathe again. However, unfortunately, my story is just one of the many stories that can be told of people who were deeply affected by my father's suicide. My mom, who is in the audience today, is alive, happy, and thriving, but she still struggles with intense PTS and anxiety. My brother, who was two years younger than me, was so deeply traumatized by what happened that he moved to Maine and rarely speaks about my dad unless it's in a song he's written. My aunt and grandmother, who were there for every step of my mom's physical and mental healing process. My stepdad, who loves my mother and us so unconditionally and has helped to heal three souls that he did not break with the patience of a saint and many other family members, friends, neighbors, and community members who his life and death has had a significant impact on. 
One person I think about often is the kind soul who was at my father's side moments after he shot himself. I filed a FOIA so I could read the police report from the day my dad died because I was still on a mission to find any missing piece that could help me heal or answer some questions. I learned that a woman who was at the beach with her daughter that day heard the gunshot and rushed to my dad's car. She opened the door and sat with him, applying pressure to his head wound and didn't leave his side until the paramedics came. That woman's life was changed forever, a complete stranger that my dad's suicide has now touched. I had a conversation with one of my dad's best friends a few months ago. This friend was also the last person we know who saw him alive. He lived down the street from us and said that he saw my dad drive by on that day on August 25th. My dad waved to him like it was any other day and kept driving. What he didn't know was what had just happened at our house between my, him and my mom. It wasn't until later that night that his friend found out that he was taking the last drive he would ever take. Through tears, he said, you know, I just thought he was waving hello, but he was really waving goodbye. At 19, I was never supposed to be sitting in a funeral home with my grandparents picking out my father's memorial picture and writing his eulogy. I never imagined I would be four months pregnant and would not get to see the look on my dad's face when I tell him he was going to be a grandfather to a beautiful baby boy. And I never thought I would be sitting in front of you telling this story. But if I can prevent this tragedy from happening to another family, to another little girl that really needed her father, that's my goal. Thank you. <clears throat> We're going to invite commissioners to uh, share some reactions, but I just thought maybe It'd be worth us, uh, it's hard to applaud for stories like that, but the bravery of the four people sitting in front of us, I just thought we, we owed it to all of them to give them another round of applause. Um, <clears throat> maybe I'll invite uh, Reverend Terry Melvin to, to respond first. Thank you um, so much. The first thing I want to do is thank each of you uh, for being here today and sharing your story with us most. Um, and I want to say to each of you that I hear you. I want that to resonate, that I hear you. Brianna, uh, you bring in a special uh, piece to this story. You know, we are looking at the system uh, and what's going on within the system itself. We've heard that we have a broken system that deals with punishment versus rehab. We've heard of a system where it is uh, not right, accepted for people to share their feelings and get the help they need. But you bring in a different perspective of the family outside that did not ask to be a part of this. And it's not being brought into the system to get a clear understanding on, on what to look for and what to be advised to uh, deal with and, and how you can be brought into the system to help the person that's, that's working within the system. So I thank you for your bravery in being here with us to bring that uh, to the table for us, it is a compelling story. And I, I say again, I hear you. Uh, to the rest of you, uh, in, in what we're dealing with here is a system uh, that I am hearing right now uh, that is broken from the sense of it is broken that we don't uh, have a system in place where uh, we as, uh, uh, we and I'm talking of the royal we as correction officers uh, have each other's back of a sense that if somebody is falling, we're picking them up, rather we are ridiculing them. We've got to figure out how to deal with that. We've got to figure out how that when somebody reaches out for help, that other correction officers are there to help them. We've got to figure out how do we create a, an environment within this system. This is what I'm hearing uh, that is open to uh, identifying areas where uh, workers need help and putting the, the helps in place.
But I just, with my small amount of time that I have left, I just want to ask each one of you if you could just give me, if you can say one thing in the system that needed to change the priority for you, the one thing, one priority for you in the system with all the things you've talked about, what would that one priority that you would leave with us as commissioners to deal with? One priority, I think, and I kind of went through it in my speech, would be to include the families in the uh, academy from the very beginning. Um, I think um, education for the families is very important on how they can recognize the warning signs in their loved ones um, early on and make it an open conversation and not so stigmatized. And yes, I think that would be valuable. I would say wellness. I think um, if you have a well-rounded staff member, it makes an easier day. So I believe wellness is very important. I just think the information. Uh, we don't even know that this is a thing when we start. We're not. We're not told it. We're not taught it. We don't. We don't know when those things start. That the job, the, the, the environment is a cause of that. So we look for other examples. We think that we're, we're who we were trained to be. We think we're doing a good job. We think this is how we're supposed to be, right? We're taught that people lie and manipulate and do all these things. The problem is we take that outside. And so when we start to change and turn into somebody that we that we weren't before we put on the badge, we're, we're not even aware of that. And, and so when we come in, the focus because here's the thing, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of research and stuff on how the environment affects the incarcerated, right? But the the analogy is this: they're they're the smokers, we get the secondhand smoke, but at the end of the day, we all get cancer, and so that needs to be that information needs to be pushed on us right away, immediately. That hey, um, you could be stabbed, but also the threat of being stabbed every day for your entire career can also change you as well. So that's what I would say. Thank you. Reverend, that's <laughs> you're asking too much. It, it, it really is. There's there's so many layered and complexity of dynamics to this environment that affects humanity. I think that that's part of the problem is that we don't recognize humanity in this. That it is a system built to isolate and contain and anything that that compromises that mission is negligible it's minutia so the fact that your kids got a you know soccer game the fact that it's your wedding anniversary the things that exist in humanity mean nothing to the system you're a body that we need to keep the system running. So I, 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 don't, <laughs> I don't know how to answer that for you, Reverend. It, it, it's humanity. That's because in the absence of that, I mean, think about this for a second. And I'm sorry, I'm going to do this. But think about this for a second. With all the AI that's building up and, the, and it's developing the ability to sense micro emotions and all of these other things why do we need people because the walls we can we can legitimately build a box stick people in eh, problem solved right so why do we need people because that's not what the system is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be helping people restore and re re reconnect to their humanity. But how can we help them do that if we're now not allowed? And actually, we're punished for, for displaying our own humanity. So... Sorry. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, I, think, I think Ken Daly wanted to hop in there. 
good morning. And first of all, uh, this is what we're going to do. All right. I want to echo what uh, Terrence had mentioned also, the uh, courage to come up and, uh, and testify. There's a, there's a lot of... Um, The uh, the vulnerability that you guys have uh, have shown today it's it's something that is uh, certainly going to sh help to shed a light uh, for a lot of us and a lot of Americans, especially those who have not served behind the walls. But we certainly help to support the the, uh, the profession. There's a couple things that um, uh, some of you had mentioned too. Uh, uh, don't give up on us. Uh, we need your help. Um, I think those are things that uh, um, very simple, very poignant. Uh, being able to make sure that there's enough attention and resources provided. I do have a question for, for those who have served, um, at least three out of four of you, not to exclude you, Brianna. And again, my condolences to you um, and appreciate the courage you've shown this morning. When you talk about staff, staff wellness programs, um, and I agree, I think that that is absolutely vital uh, from day one. Do you feel uh, some level of deceit that there was not provided uh, some level of, uh, I would say, honesty, candor about what you might, uh, how you might feel about the profession, whether that's 30 days in, three years in, a decade in. And the second part is, um, for are, are there any staff wellness programs that are provided today and of any sort, whether it's maybe in the beginning, uh, or, or is there any resource available to correctional officers? We know that, that sometimes there are uh, counselors that come around for, for inmates, for mental health. Um, what is afforded to correctional officers today in, the, in your experiences? Um, look, at, on the job application, there should be the same warning label that's on cigarettes. <laughs> that this job has the potential to impact your well-being, your social engagement, cause hypertension, diabetes, you run the gamut. Actually, we did create a fake label. Well, it's not fake, it's very much real. Um, but yeah, that deceit, and it, it truly is. Look, equivalent exchange, you pay me to do a job. What you're not disclosing about the job is the deceit, is the, is the imbalance of that equivalent exchange. I'm giving you my heart, soul, energy, you know, presence, but you're taking, again, my humanity from me because you're telling me that I can't be the human being we all want when we're on the street and engaging. Uh, and I'll jump on a soapbox real quick, so I'm not going to do that. But the, the second part, look, this is a nascent field. There's, look, for, for everybody else in society, there are phenomenal wellness programs. Trust me, we've been on this. I think all of us have been looking at what's going on outside and see the services that exist. But there are none that are, are there's, there's so again, nascent in application to us, there needs more, there needs to be more, it needs to be more dynamic because the, what they're trying to overcome is so vast. And we're, like I said, we're not starting from scratch. There's a lot of trauma that already exists to try and get people to, to step up. This whole conversation is really complicated because everybody needs something different, right? And so when you start to talk about a wellness program or developing something, uh, everybody needs something something different. And that's very difficult uh, to, to tackle, especially if you've never worked the job, if you've never, never carried the keys. And, and like he said, we're 24 seven, we never stop. It's not like we can stop and have an officer appreciation day where you feed me free hot dogs. Some of us still have to work. Some of us are eating hot dogs in front of the, the, the people that are, we're supervising. It, it, it's, it's bad. And she said it in her speech, uh, there's an eight hour wellness 
training every year, once a year, eight hours. Okay, very good. I took a 40-hour crisis intervention class to teach, to teach me how to talk to de-escalate individuals incarcerated. 40 hours. But, but they gave me eight hours to go home and say, hey, uh, you know, I know you just did CPR on the, on, in the shower on that kid, and he's dead, and thank you, but we need you to work another shift. And then when you go home, try not to yell at your kids because we didn't give you the tools to process what you just saw. Uh, so for eight hours a year, thank you very much for doing that. But, but <laughs> this job, you can see, doesn't only affect me. It affects our family as well. Brianna could be my daughter. And this, is, this is what it is. And the other part to that is because we've been neglected for so long, uh, I don't trust anything you put forward, right? Because I know that you're not going to follow through on anything. Because we're all going to sit here, we're going to talk about this, and it's going to be fun, and then we're all going to go home, and I still have to work. I still have to deal with the same stuff that I dealt with before I came here. And so until there's that follow-through, until that, there's that genuine investment in, in my life, in my kids' life, then what am I going to do? I'm only going to come to work and care about what my coworkers are feeling, how they're feeling. How can we survive this shift and go home? Because for you, who goes home at 5 o'clock, and I'm saying you know, leadership and people implement these programs, your day ends. You go home, and, 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 and we don't. We have to stay there. Even when I'm home, I'm not, I'm not home. There's a, there's a fantastic story by Ray Bradbury, the rocket man. You should read it because that's what correctional officers are. I'm the rocket man. And uh, uh, when I'm in space, all I can think about is home. And when I'm at home, all I can think about is work. And that's, and that's crazy. And that's only because I get my eight-hour training that they check the box and say, hey, here you go. You're good. But that's not enough. That's just not enough for us. So I can echo what the both of them have said. Um, and unfortunately, I think it's something that needs to begin in the beginning. Um, what about the people that are well invested? They, they don't put the time in. Um, yes, we did take a step. And the only reason my union have to, we have taken a step is because we have noticed that there have been so many death, deaths after we've had members that have retired and died a month a month after retirement so do i think it's enough no i don't i think it needs to start in the beginning the eight hours that they give us yes is it is it is it good for the members absolutely but that's something we negotiated that's our union negotiating that that's not the agency giving it to us that is them recognizing, yes, there is a problem, but is eight hours enough? No. So do I think there needs to be more? Yes, I do. Um, I'm going to invite Darielle Kennedy if you want to respond. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so my father has been incarcerated for 20 years, and so um, I kind of resonated a lot with what you were saying, Brianna, about you know just that loss and about that grieving. I always fear getting that phone call and not knowing, um, not having those answers, probably not having the accessibility of filing an um, um, of information act to know what it will be that will possibly end my father's life, whether it's COVID, whether it's another incarcerated person, whether it's somebody showing excessive force um, in any type of situation. Um, also missing those moments, like you said, you had a beautiful child. Um, I'll be graduating in a week and he still won't, won't be here. Um, and so I really, uh, resonated with that sense of loss and that sense of grief, although yours is very different from mine. Um, and usually before I did Bridging the Gap, it would have been this us versus them narrative where I wouldn't have even been able to um, hear the stories of correctional officers or even hear about your own loss and think about correctional officers' family members um, because my focus was on incarcerated people's family members um, because I am one. And so I did want to get into some of
Can you hear me? Okay. Um, some of what you all were talking about, it seemed like competing narratives about, you know, this experience of, you know, the threat of being stabbed, but you also want to be able to um, help incarcerated people be able to reconnect and so and, and be able to show humanity on both sides for correctional officers and incarcerated people. And so how is it that this prison culture can be changed where we acknowledge that you do have this threat of harm every day when you go into work, but then you also want to achieve this responsibility of helping incarcerated people reconnect. In what ways have you already done this work? Or in what ways do you think that this work can be done? So the job has changed a little bit from, from 20 years ago when we would just lock people up, throw, throw them in a cell, and just let them be, right? Now it's uh, rehabilitation, it's reintegration, it's reacclimation to society. The problem is we haven't trained the ch changed the training of the officers. So I'm still taught to do the job the way I was taught 20 years ago, but then they're introducing you know, mental health programs and, and all, all of these, these avenues uh, for the incarcerated to, to better themselves. Um, and then they're still having us supervise that. The problem is I don't have any understanding of what any of that is unless I go get it myself, right? And so my role from uh, custodial, you know, from, from custody staff is now almost more of a counselor role, right, to be supportive. And, and I currently work in community correction, so I, I'm, I'm involved in that process, helping people find jobs, helping people, you know, uh, you know, get their GEDs, things like that. Little things that I took for granted because somebody showed me how to do that, that now we're showing them how to do. But I think that because we're not taught, our, our, our training hasn't changed to match that, we're not shown the importance of that, right? To, to hey, if this person betters themselves inside, because they get out, and then we go, our kids go to school at the same school, we all hang out at the same place, so we want them to be better, right? You need to show us the, the, the importance of that, and you need to change the training of, and just for a simple example, 20 years ago, somebody kicking on a door was just being a jerk. Now they may be having a psychotic episode. They may be you know, schizophrenic or bipolar or something like that. If I don't know that, if I'm not aware of the mental health challenges and things like that, then we're gonna handle it differently, right? But now, kind of the push is slow that down a little bit. And so what I've done is I've gone and tried to find and read everything I can on, on mental health, on communication, on de-escalation, on whatever I can, because you, you realize after a while that, that jail and prison is not what you thought it was before you went there, right? That, that these people are just people passing through, that made, they turn left instead of turning right, and, and that's what it is. And so you start to deal with them as humans, as individuals, and, 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 and then that's where like the progress goes, right? So there's a, there's a saying that I hate and that people have said it to me a hundred times, you know, they say, don't talk to me like an inmate when I, I'm outside home and I get kind of crappy with people. Everybody here has probably heard that. Uh, Go ahead, preach it. But the reality is, the reality is I'm not talking to them like an inmate. I'm actually talking more disrespectful to them than I do the, the, the inmates, right? And it's because we have that working relationship because we're in there together, because I'm vested. I spend all of my time, my emotional energy in helping them do what they have to do, it, helping them get their ID, helping them navigate this course. But then when I go home, I don't have any left for my kids. Right? So our training, again, everything for me is, is you have to know what the problem is. And, and if we say, hey, this job is not what it was 20 years ago. The focus cannot be what it was 20 years ago. Why don't you learn this? Why don't you read this? Why don't we have continuing education on mental health? So officers are better equipped to handle that situation. It'll be safer for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we'll go to Amanda and then Mary Kay and then we'll we'll take our break. Thank you all. I've I've learned a lot from listening to you. I used to cover uh, courts and crime, and I visited many prisons, and I wrote about uh, incarcerated individuals, and I wrote about crime victims, and I am I'm embarrassed to say I I never really thought that much about corrections officers um, until I met Andy and and heard the stories of other corrections officers. And you start to realize, I think you said it, Mr. Walker, that there's there's like 
this us versus them lens we got going in a lot of parts of our country, right? It breaks down the more you listen to people's stories, right? The, there's not a bright line between incarcerated individuals, from what you're telling me, right, and corrections officers. You can't separate the father from the corrections officer. You can't separate the mother from the crime victim. Like, you just can't put people in these boxes the way the system and the discourse wants to, and often journalists, right? Um, Democrat, Republican, like all these things break down at some point to the point where I hope one day we can all become as suspicious as you all are of those splitting techniques, right? In, in, in politicians' rhetoric, in, in the news media, that's splitting. And the more anxiety and uncertainty people feel, I've noticed, the more they split the world into good versus evil. So it's very tempting, right, to do that. I wonder if you have any, anything you'd like to say or, or things that you wish members of the news media understood. I don't know, in your community, the way that they write about the criminal justice system or about uh, facilities that you work in. What would be your ask of journalists? Okay, real quick. <laughs> I don't write ri really well, so I use a program called Grammarly. And I was writing this article and, and, and had the word prison guard in it. it. It highlighted the word and said, this is archaic and may be offensive. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. How is it that this program knows this, but all these writers keep <laughs> writing prison guard. <laughs> Us versus them. Prison guards are supposed to be barbaric, brutal, uneducated, susceptible to bribes. Here, name one movie, with just one that depicts, there's only one, and if you get it, I'll, I'll get up and give you a hug, <laughs> that depicts prison guards in a positive light. Nope, he left the sponge wet. I mean dry. <laughs> Next. Reuben Hurricane Carter. The warden was a jerk. No, no offense, wardens. <laughs> But the officer, he showed Reuben compassion, understanding, empathy. He called him sir. He let him wear, wear hospital scrubs as opposed to the uniform because Reuben refused to admit that he was a criminal. Look, we, and, and he said it, we live with these guys. This amount of compassion and understanding goes a hell of a lot further than any, any physical exertion that you can apply to an individual. And the other part of it is that I started at age 24, 23, 24. Dude, I was on, the one, on, on one of my living units, went to middle school, high school, and college with me. And he was behind the door, knew my nickname, knew I ran track, knew my best friend's name. So there's no line. There's no us versus them. We are us, period. And I don't even know what your question was. <laughs> well said. Uh, Mary Kay? I just wanted to uh, express how incredibly powerful what each and every one of you said to me and how I thought a lot about the 100,000 uh, corrections officers in our union and how um, 
little I understand about the weight that is carried by those officers every day and that you transformed through your story an understanding that is beyond what I've been able to absorb in my relationship with corrections officers. Because I was thinking about Millie. Um, I know Millie as the president of the union. I see Millie care deeply about all the corrections officers that she represents, but I don't really understand the enemy and the threat in the way that you described it. And I've never really understood the system and the structure that you're challenging that robs everybody of their humanity and that that's structured in. And I've gotten little insights from people before, but this panel powerfully conveyed both inside the wall, but it at home, and then the impact on family um, in a way that I, I really hope as commissioners that we will work with one voice to um, override your completely legitimate distrust that anything's ever going to change <laughs> and that somehow we can make change happen together. Um, and then the other thing you four didn't get a chance to see but that I wanted to convey was the number of nodding heads in this room that makes you understand that it is a system that is robbing people of their ability to be fully human, not, not just at work, but in their entire life. And that is wrong, and it's outrageous, and enough is enough. And I just wanted to thank Andy um, for uh, taking this to a national conversation where the secret's out. And the silence is broken, and we have to act uh, together. And um, it's just an incredible honor, and I'm incredibly grateful for you connecting our head, hearts, and minds. I realize that I look at the men primarily, and some women in this room that I've had decades of relationships with, but that I don't understand. And I have to admit to you, I'm, a, I'm ashamed of it. Uh, because it's just a reflection of how that structure kept us from understanding what one another was going through and how the union could be a vehicle for beyond the eight hours, how are we challenging the entire system, you know, and, and changing it. So I just wanted to express my deep, deep gratitude for the panelists, but also one voice putting the commissioners in front. And I assume I shouldn't ask a question because you want to get to a break. Is that right? Okay. Thank you. Can I, can I just say one thing? Just one thing. I know. I'm sorry, Simon. Ms. Henry, it's not your fault. It's the system teaches us not to tell people what we go through. So that's my one thing. Sorry, Simon. No Simon, problem. As, as we move forward, can we just, <laughs> can, 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 can we just take a moment? I got to get my CO voice together over here. <laughs> we are going on a break. <laughs> can we take, before, before we break, though, before we break. <laughs> I've known Simon a long time. Before we break. Can we all just take a standing ovation for these folks that had the courage to tell their story? Welcome back, everybody. Hope you got a chance to catch your breath. I'm about to introduce panel number two, and I just wanted to urge folks to maybe take a glance to your left and to your right. We heard some very powerful stories this morning for some people. They may have brought up things that you don't talk about every day, things that you're handling, processing, dealing with yourself, or trying not to deal with yourself. And so just take a look around, check in on whoever's nearby you. Um, and if, this is, if those discussions, those presentations, those brave testimonies do provoke something in you, please do reach out and don't feel like you have to now sit with it uh, by yourself or alone or in private. So thank you. Uh, panel number two, 
um, is entitled Another Way is Possible. Uh, the idea here is that we have um, three experts uh, coming from very different perspectives, backgrounds, experiences, um, and uh, their sharing with us, with the commission and with all of you is meant to build on what we heard from the first panel, to build on those firsthand accounts and testimonies and talk about, um, so what can we do about some of these things? What these, as uh, many of our panelists said this morning on panel one, those were real individual stories, but they were not isolated to these individuals, right? These are, this is system wide. Right? This affects everybody that the system touches, and we have three people with us now who are going to share a little bit about their perspective on that, their knowledge, and, and some of their ideas. So I think we'll start um, with Mike Pataro. We'll go first, and then we'll go to Tor Eric, and then we'll go to Katerina Spinaris. Okay? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. How are you today? My name is Dr. Mike Pitaro. I'm Associate Professor of Criminal Justice with American Military University and adjunct with East Stroudsburg University in Pennsylvania. Um, I think, first of all, <laughs> holy crap, to try to um, be the next speaker after those four had spoken is uh, a little bit more difficult. So during the break, I had to like pivot a little bit and uh, switch some things around there and gather my thoughts. Um, that was powerful. I don't think I've ever been at a, an event or a conference or anything where it actually really got to me and choked me up. Even though I know about this, hearing it firsthand from others, um, you know, outside of your own experiences is pretty powerful. I want to give you a little bit of background. My background is in corrections. I started off as um, a front-level worker, just worked my way up through the ranks into administration. And I had the advantage or fortunate um, advantage of kind of volleying back and forth between custody and treatment so I could see both sides of it. Um, right around 2007, uh, one of the individuals I had worked with in corrections had died by suicide. It came as a shock, or at least we thought it came as a shock. Um, after, you know, you reflect on it a while, you start to see the signs and symptoms that were there and didn't really necessarily do anything. He would come into work disheveled. He kind of just appeared like he was just wasn't sleeping much and everything like that. But at the time, the, the climate of corrections at the time was a little bit more punitive in that respect. That if you mentioned anything about any weaknesses or what was perceived to be weaknesses or vulnerabilities that could be held against you. And when I moved into administration, I can assure you it was held against you. So that's a huge part of this. Um, but as I kind of stepped into going into roughly about my 16th year in corrections, I started to feel some things. I was burning out. I was stressed. I felt like I was hitting a brick wall. Um, I felt like my voice wasn't heard anymore. The stress started to get to me, led to marital problems. Marital problems then bled into work. Work bled into the marriage. And it just became this very cumulative type of despair. Um, and if anybody has ever experienced depression, deep, dark depression, you feel like you're just lost, you're lonely, you have nowhere to go to. And I'm sure everyone in the room can attest to the fact that in this profession, you're supposed to be in control. You're supposed to maintain that control. You're the helper, you're the fixer, and that's my personality as well. But I couldn't fix myself. And so I found myself digging myself deeper into this depression to the point where I was scared. I started having really dark thoughts and couldn't get myself out of it. And I didn't trust anybody to talk to, my own family, close friends, especially people I worked with, for fear of judgment. You know, I, I, I help people, not Mike Patero is in trouble. He doesn't get in trouble. I help others. And so it was a panic mode that led to that. Thankfully, I worked my way through it, and that's kind of how or rather what led to me actually focusing on this as an educator. So my personal experience combined with the education and experience of working in corrections kind of helped catapult this to a new direction. So when I left corrections, I became executive director of an outpatient facility thinking, okay, that maybe is the cure-all. Um, that didn't necessarily work as well. So I had started teaching in 2002, loved it, worked part-time. It was positive, it was rewarding, students, you know, got it, you know, and it just was a better feeling. 
but I still couldn't shake, you know, the fact that others I had worked with that still stayed in corrections were still dying. Whether it's dying by suicide or, as been mentioned earlier, dying by some type of physical illness, mostly cardiovascular disease. You know, with the average life expectancy of age 59, and I'm 55 as of this current day, that's a huge reality check that I'm not ready to die. So, and that's a huge problem. So it's not just beyond the uh, mental health challenges, but it's also the physical challenges. So I wrote this article, this is kind of like a backstory. So I wrote this article in 2017. It was just basically an interest of mine. As, um, and it was titled, uh, Correctional Officers or Correctional Officers Are Dying, It's Time for an Open Discussion. That article, which really wasn't anything profound or anything, but it opened the door in a sense to others reading it and saying, oh my God, same issue here. So that expanded then into trainings, it expanded into other conferences and publications um, and consulting about this. And what I learned quickly was, as I delved into the research, is there's no research, okay? Or at the time, it was extremely limited compared to law enforcement, which there was an abundance of literature on law enforcement with mental health issues. But with corrections, the paucity of uh, research was just so limited. So I had to dig deeper and found some studies that, once again, limited, but kind of grasped what I wanted to tell. So then I realized quickly that it wasn't just a Mike Patero problem, it just wasn't a you know, Department of Corrections in Pennsylvania problem. This was nationwide, this was international. This is the culture of corrections, particularly in the United States, that is very toxic. And so in order to truly help ourselves, we will in turn help those who are incarcerated as well. This kind of has a ripple effect. So, when I um, published this article, it then led to some other, you know, publications on that. And I decided to kind of expand a little bit further. And I wanted to find out, all right, we know what the signs are, we know what the symptoms are, and right now we know what the causes are. But what can we do to prevent it? You know, what can we do to minimize those symptoms and those feelings that we have? So I kind of took it on a, like a multi-prong approach and I started delving into, you know, physical fitness, physical activity, not necessarily, when I say fitness, some people get, oh my God, <laughs> you know, but some types of things like that, some type of activity where you're moving, then get into, I don't like to use the word diet, but clean eating, you know, eating healthier, and trying to work on the physical end of it as well, because we have high rates of, you know, high blood pressure, car, um, high cholesterol. So trying to address those issues, as well as tackling the fact that we need some type of stress reduction, some type of stress outlet, for ourselves. For me personally, it's working out. I like to work out. I know some people do not like to work out. You know, I know people that run. I hate running. I've tried it numerous times and I don't get it. So it's just, it's, I don't get that whole joggers high that they talk about. I could run five miles, I'm still not high. So <laughs> I gave that up. So working out is my outlet, but walking, anything, walking your dog, just something to get you out there. But more importantly, to focus on ourselves because I think we have a tendency to kind of care for those around us but not necessarily care for ourselves. And that's a huge problem. For me personally, and I think many will agree with this, it, it was hard to open up. I think that I had to swallow my pride and to share my feelings and that was a tough one for me. Um, and so trying to get over that stigma of basically ourselves, getting out of our own way, is a huge issue right there. But I then led, um, led into research on leadership because one of the areas of concerns that's come up in the surveys has been leadership. Whether it's poor leadership, whether it's deficient, weak leadership, or leadership just not supporting you or not feeling that you're valued or any type of empowerment, I focused on transformational leadership, something that I'm a huge advocate for. I am an advocate for that coaching, mentoring type of mentality. Um, it worked for me in corrections. It works for me in education. It's just something I embrace and I've been trying to spread that around. Not that it's everybody's cup of tea, but it works for me in trying to have that different type of thought process. For example, when I was in corrections at the time, I've always been a visionary, kind of an, a, you know, a, a thinker, you know, and I always have been ambitious and I'm like, okay, Florida's doing this cool program. We should try this at the prison. Ah, no, we're not gonna try that. I'm like, 
why? <laughs> no, 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 we're not going to try that. And it was just ended like that. So every time I had an idea, it was just squashed with, no, we're not going to do that. You know, if it ain't broken, don't fix it type of thing. But it was broken. <laughs> That's the thing. It was broken. And nobody was trying to fix the system. So leadership was a huge issue. And then when I went into becoming an administrator, I couldn't and actually kind of passed those policies and procedures to get everybody on board because those that were above me in the hierarchy were squashing those ideas. You know, and I think that part of that problem too is for those who have moved into administration, sometimes there's a tendency to forget your roots, to forget where you came from. And so we would make decisions as leaders of corrections and yet not include the correctional officers who are actually implementing those policies and procedures, which made absolutely no sense to me. And so it's trying to combine the two, that we're all trying to address a similar problem here, that if we want to increase morale or improve morale, and we want to you know, increase our retention here from officers using corrections as a stepping stone to other positions and trying to retain those officers, we need to make some changes. So I focused on leadership. I focused on the physical aspects of it. I focused more so on um, the mental health aspects of it as well. I started to publish articles that I think worked for me, just to share that knowledge of, you know, hey, this worked for me. Maybe you want to give it a try. Um, I'm fortunate to live in an area that's uh, very wooded with a lot of trails that kind of, I don't know, kind of deprograms me and kind of recharges. I like to just walk into nature and just kind of get that feeling there. Anything to kind of get out of the system. Learn more about compartmentalization and trying to separate what you had at work and trying not to bring it home, trying not to bring an argument at home into work and vice versa and how it could intermingle and then uh, create more problems. And then for many of us, myself included, is you have to watch for the excessive drinking. Uh, the bottle, unfortunately, is one of our outlets. It's not obviously an appropriate or a positive outlet, but it is an outlet. Um, as the research has shown, we have high rates of alcohol, excessive alcohol usage, um, problem drinking. We have high rates of divorce. We have high rates of, um, let's see, being terminated. So it's just like we're, we're elevated in all respects. So the, the culture itself is very toxic and that's been my passion and that leads into why I'm here. My passion is trying to change the entire culture of corrections. The first article came out in 2017. The frustration that I have and that many shared in the first panel is that we know all this, we've been talking about a lot of these things, but nothing has come to fruition. So you know, I'll write an article, people in the room will read it, you know, other academics will read it, but the policymakers aren't reading them. The people that need to be reading this, the people that need to be interacting and consulting with us are not. And this is where we're having like this, this kind of blockade that needs to be overcome. So my goal is now trying to get out there and get this platform that I have. You know, as an educator, um, I'm thankful every single day because I have a platform to then basically express myself and kind of illuminate or highlight those deficiencies and weaknesses within the criminal justice system, including corrections, without fear of repercussions, which is awesome. So if I were still in the corrections field, you're limited what you could say because that could be held against you and that's the last thing that you want. So I try to you know, highlight, not just for correctional officers, but for those that are incarcerated as well, highlight the weaknesses, deficiencies, and the areas that still need that attention. My, excuse me, my niche though has been focusing on the correctional officers. Now, as the um, young woman mentioned before our break, and I'm glad that she mentioned that, this isn't just a focus on male correctional officers, but just correctional staff in general, men, women, those that work in custody, those that are programmatic staff, uh, ancillary staff, all of those individuals make it up. And I had to learn that myself. In the first publication, I referred to correctional officers and referred to males, he, him, and realized that I'm forgetting about females that work in the system as well. So addressing that entire group there. Then, of course, there are those that are drug and alcohol counselors. There are those that are teachers, um, recreational directors, all those that kind of still work within the correction setting that are still impacted by what goes on in our nation's prisons. So. It's, it's time for a change, and the reason I was so excited and passionate about coming here today 
is that I feel like we are making the change. This is the highlight. This right here is kind of like seven, eight years of work coming to fruition where people of different backgrounds are hearing our stories and trying, and we'll hopefully bring this back to share with their network and then continue onward. You know, we all have networks and um, in corrections or even in academia, you share amongst yourselves. So again, it's still limited. So I'm trying to expand out and this is what helps us kind of like lead out into that. So I'm hoping that we can continue this dialogue even after we leave here today and that we can share our contact information and hopefully kind of expand on a lot of these thoughts. Um, it's, it's become such an important area and it's become an area that, it's funny because I, I wrote the article and didn't necessarily expect that it would take off like that and didn't expect that it would become anything more than just another article. But it led to the culmination of a book in which I now use in my classes to try to educate those who want to get into corrections. So I'm thinking, okay, part of the problem is that if I can't address it necessarily on the back end, let me try to, I'm Italian, I talk, and I'm looking at myself and the camera's going, oh my God, my, wa <laughs> my wife is gonna yell at me. <laughs> That's the one thing she said, don't talk with your hands, keep your hands on the table. And I'm like, uh, I'm like, shit, I just messed up. <laughs> Now I'm cognizant of it, so I'm going to keep them under the table. So, <laughs> so my apologies for that. But anyway, <laughs> oh my God. Okay. So I, rather than just attacking the back end and trying to work with correctional officers in today's prisons that are dealing with this, which I think we're doing a cumulative or collective, we, we're doing a great job. I wanted to kind of get it from the front end. And as an educator, I have the advantage of working with individuals and preparing them for entry into the criminal justice system, particularly into corrections, what to expect. And I don't sugarcoat it like I had it explained to me when I was a student. You know, oftentimes, you know, you have this glimpse when you're a criminal justice student that, student that everything is, you know, car chases and gun battles and, you know, all this excitement like superhero stuff. And then the reality of it is, whoa, okay, it's much more different than that. So I prepare them the good and the bad. And it took a little while for the administration to get on board with that too, because but I think it's a realistic approach. Yes, it's stressful. Yes, there's gonna be challenges that you're gonna face, physical and mental health challenges. But this is how you can either prevent them or minimize them from occurring. And if they do start occurring, this is what you can do to try to get yourself some help. That is my main goal, is to prevent the loss of life for those that I have worked with, those that I continue to work with as students who become professionals. Because again, this isn't just a corrections problem, this is in criminal justice in general. Um, at the end of this month or next month, I'll be talking to probation officers in uh, Pennsylvania addressing their needs. So it's kind of overlaps. So trying to get students to prepare. The other part of it is, Corrections was and may still be a stepping stone to other careers. People use it just to kind of move into something else, trying to stop that from occurring, trying to make this the actual profession that it is and deserves to be in the recognition that it has, and for the men and women who do work in this profession to be recognized for their efforts. So in order to do so, you have to make it more attractive. You have to present it as a more lucrative type of profession to be involved in. I think for a lot of us in the room, you get into corrections and then you stay when you realize that the stability of the job, the security of the job, the nice pay that comes along with it, the nice benefits, the early retirement. And that's, that's important, I understand that. But as we've mentioned several times over, you know, the high or the low life expectancy is a huge concern of ours, and it should be. And sadly, you know, as I've creeped up the ladder with the 50s, I've encountered individuals who I've worked with who didn't necessarily also die by suicide, but simply died of natural causes caused by some type of physical illness. And as you know, COVID just, you know, expanded on that and created a, a huge, huge problem for officers in and of themselves. One of my former students, 30 years old, physically fit, two young kids died by COVID. So it's just a huge impact. Um, trying to move this profession forward is a combined effort. And so each year I meet more and more people, you know, from different sections of the United States, 
Norway, you know, and have that ability then to kind of take this profession forward. My goal as I continue though, is to work with others to try to focus on the stress management, try to focus on stress reduction, and try to educate officers that are current officers as well as future to be aware of what they're going to possibly encounter and how to counteract that. Um, to do so, I went to be a uh, suicide facilitator, suicide prevention facilitator. Um, over the quarantine, kind of get some extra credentials in there so I can then address it with first responders. So one of my goals in the very near future is to go into the Department of Corrections and start doing trainings free, you know, because I know that budgets always come up. It's a freebie. Um, go in there and start talking about it, but give a realistic glimpse of, okay, this is probably what you're um, encountering right now or maybe encountering, and this is what you can expect to deal with. So that is my goal, is to try to expand this and to try to continue working with others. I think collectively we have a bigger voice than just one or two individuals. And I see my red thing is flashing, so I gotta go. Thank you everyone, I appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Uh, Tor Eric probably traveled the longest distance to be here to testify today. And we'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Simon. Is it on? Now it's on. Okay. Uh, you good? Yes. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Tuud Erik Larsen, uh, and uh, I'm a correctional officer from Norway. Not right now. Right now, I'm a union leader from Norway. Uh, and uh, I'm here to talk about a possible better way forward. I'm not saying it is a better forward, way forward for you, but it could be. So, but first of all, my background. I'm a correctional officer, uh, then I turned into a union rep, and now I'm a union leader. It, this does not make me an expert on change, but it has given me a unique opportunity to be involved in many different processes of change, both on an individual and an organizational level. Uh, all my years of service have been either as a part of the rank and file or as a union rep. Uh, and it's in, as the union rep, I've been in the most, dif uh, most directly involved in, in, in change process. It hasn't always worked perfectly, uh, but change is the one thing that we can count on. It always, it's always happening. Something's always changing. Uh, and how we re relate to it is what will define us as leaders. So, first of all, I think I'll, I'm gonna have to take a step back and, and, and talk a bit about Norway. And uh, I've told, Simon knows this, so he said they're gonna think you're from a different planet. <laughs> but I, sh I sh assure you I'm not, just a different country. So, workers in Norway have a constitutional right to influence their own workplace. Uh, there is even a special law called the Work Environment Act that secure workers' safety uh, and their right to be a part of the decision-making through a union. There's a written agreement called the Basic Agreement between the workers, IA unions, and the government that states that how the unions and the employers have to work together to create, create the best results. And in public service, the best result will always be to deliver the best possible service as efficiently and as cost effectively as possible. I'm not here to tell you that the US should copy the Norwegian or Nordic model uh, but it has some valid points that I have seen firsthand can improve almost any private business or public service sector anywhere in the world. 
First and foremost, there is a fundamental link between employer and worker through the unions. Uh, the basic agreement is a tool to prevent wasteful conflict uh, between workers and employers. It doesn't eliminate tension, but it does reduce waste and distraction. So the Nordic model has many important points, but the most important thing to understand is the essential purpose of the agreement. Through the model, both employer and the unions have entered into the agreement with the purpose of creating the best possible basis for cooperation. Uh, along with the Work Environment Act, this uh, agreement is the basis for worker influence on our own workplaces. Uh, it's meant to ensure that the workers have actual influence on our own workplace, how work is organized, and how the method and approach to the work is developed. The agreement is to be used as a tool to develop leadership, workers' influence, and work environment. The model gives every wor worker the possibility for both professional and personal growth. Uh, the opportunity to develop mutual cooperation, cooperation so that it can con contribute to a flexible and user-friendly service with a good work environment, good leadership, better results, and a good relation with society. So to achieve this, unions and employers regularly meet to focus on three topics. The first one is information. There's an obli obligation for the employer to inform the unions of anything that will influence the workers. And this obligation is mutual. The unions also have to inform the employer of their activity that could, inf could or would influence the, the employer. Any issue that could end up as a discussion or a negotiation has to be disclosed here before it can be discussed or negotiated. So the second topic is discussion. Uh, there's a long list of activities that the employer has to discuss with the unions before he or she can make a decision. In fact, there is also the possibility for the unions to demand uh, a discussion before the employer makes a decision. Budget, building project, business plans, training programs, all examples of, uh, of matters that have, to be, that have to be discussed before a decision is made. The list goes on, but because discussions can be demanded by the union, it's not a complete list. It's not necessary to reach an agreement in each case, but it's important that the union's voice is heard. It's also a great opportunity for the employer to trouble, troubleshoot his or her own ideas before they implement them. So the third topic is uh, negotiations. And unlike discussions, uh, the list for uh, negotiations are, is exhaustive. And all the elements that can be negotiated have to be within the employer's area of authority, within the approved budget, and be in line with the instructions and the political priorities that have been determined for the business. A change in the organizational chart or an increase in staffing are example, uh, examples of cases that have to be negotiated. So this is a very rough summary of the agreement, of course. Uh, and I haven't, haven't said anything about what happens if the employers and unions can't agree. <laughs> and that happens. Uh, or, or what if one of the parties breaches the agreement? Uh, but I could probably say a lot about that, but, but for today, the point of the agreement is to further cooperation between unions and employers and to make sure that we provide the best ser service possible, create the best outcomes and do it efficiently. Before I came to the US to testify at this commission, I had a talk with the Assistant Director of Corrections in Norway. I told him I was coming here to talk about the basic agreement as an instrument for making a better way forward, uh, and that I wonder what he would say if he was here. His f uh, with his first instinct, he said, I'm all for it. And then after a while, he, he said, I don't think that involving the unions in the decision-making makes, makes it flawless, but it certainly gives me a better basis for making the decision, uh, making better decisions, and the fact that the unions sign off on a decision gives, a more, gives it more legitimacy with the workers. 
the bigger the decision, the more important it is to have talked it through with the unions before the decision is made. So now, what, if anything, does this have to do with change and finding a better way forward? Well, whether you want to improve staff health and wellness, inmate conditions, or the finan financial structure and cost of corrections, you have to ask the question, what led to this? Why are we here? And are we satisfied with the way things are currently? In the 1950s, these questions were asked in Norway, and that what, that's what has led us to where we are today, a total rehabilitation of how we thought of corrections. To improve staff health and wellness, we realized that we also had to improve living conditions in prisons, and we had to look at the financial cost in a different way. We had to see cost as an investment to create a saving further down the line. The commission that asked these questions in Norway understood that to improve the impact prisoners, prisons have on everyone they touch, the government had to actually invest more money directly into corrections. But in the long term, the savings would make the total cost of corrections lower. With more money, the staff in corrections could get better training, better staffing plans and, and ratios and work with more rehabilitative measures and prepare the inmates for meeting life on the outside in a much better way. In increased staffing gives you better work hours, better possibilities for training and continuing education, better poss possibilities to positively influence the inmate uh, and get to know them as people and not just inmates. But all that costs more. All that requires treating the people who work in the prisons as the true professionals they are. Crucial to succeed in the model is the focus on dynamic security. At its core, it's made the staff feel more secure at work. And next to dynamic security, we use the term static and organizational security. Uh, the dynamic security com complements static elements like the walls, the fences, the doors, the cameras and the organizational measures overlap between shifts so you can inform your colleagues of what's going on, uh, time for training, inmate staff ratio, work hours, etc. And the dynamic way of working is, is basically just dialogue uh, between officer and inmate. The general idea is that if the officer knows the inmate, it's easier to influence the inmate. And if the inmate trusts the officer, it's less likely that he or she will attack the officer, uh, and more likely that the officer can influence the inmate in his or her decision-making going on in the future. The important thing to, do, to remember is that to implement dynamic security, you need both static and organizational security. If they are not there, it will be impossible to create a safe frame for dynamic work. In Norway, we come from a history of thinking that incarceration should be a time for solitary penance and prayer. And many citizens still think it should be that way. Today, we have evolved from that and we use the principle of normality, uh, which is basically just to try and make life on the inside as similar to life on the outside as possible. We believe that the deprivation of liberty is the punishment and nothing more. We try to use the time an, an inmate is incarcerated to, to make a positive change so that they are better equipped to live a life without crime when they are released. It has been a long journey from the 1950s and up to the, today's correctional principles. One of the main reasons we have been able to make this change is the basic agreement and, and the fact that employer and union have to cooperate in decision making. This effort to change has also changed the nature of the job for those of us working in corrections. First, our training academy. In the past 70 years, we have gone from on-the-job training to a two-year paid academy training. 
The Academy in Norway combines academic with practical training, and it has a one-year mandatory service after you graduate. So just imagine having two years to build the correct toolbox for a correctional officer. The ratio of those who are incarcerated to officers differs, but the staffing ratio is 1.1 staff to every inmate. Small but important things like the overlap between when officers leave from one shift and arrive for the next shift as a part of, uh, as a part of the organizational security. This is a, important so the officers can discuss follow-up uh, on certain inmates and do a general run-up of, of the day. In information is important and saves lives. So we haven't reached our goals yet. Uh, and corrections in Norway is anything but flawless. Mm. But we have made progress. We still have work to do on stress, PTSD, and wellness. We have learned a lot from our brothers and sisters here about this issue, and our work isn't done. But the expectations and conditions of incarcerated have changed, and we are safer and more satisfied as a result. It takes time to reform anything, but especially corrections. Because you're not just reforming a sector of public service, you're changing part, parts of a cultural identity in a nation. To do that, it's important to have as many allies as possible when you start. This has not been an easy reform, and I don't think it would have been possible without the co cooperation between the employer side and the unions to think outside the box, to imagine a different way of doing things, and to in ensure that those of us who work on the front lines every day have our interests and voice, voices recognized and so that the new system works for us and for everyone it touches. That cooperation is based on a basic agreement as a tool for building cooperation and to facilitate change. It is ba based on respecting correctional staff and about a national, national culture that decided more than 50 years ago to do something different. So in closing, when you hear about the Norway model for corrections, remember what made the, that a success is the Norway model of co-responsibility and cooperation between unions and employers. Thank you for listening. Thank you to our Katerina Spinaris. Good morning. I'm Katerina Spinaris. I thank you for taking time from your precious day to be here with us today. Uh, my background is psychotherapy and um, I'm a research psychologist as well. And so I'll come from a perspective of a clinician and a researcher. In, and also as a human being talking about human beings I love. Correctional staff and their family members. My walk into corrections, my journey, has started very uh, unexpectedly and not by my design. I simply moved from one part of Colorado to a rural area that was saturated with prisons. Altogether, three counties had 17 prisons and the corresponding county jails. So as I set up a little part-time private practice there, and I thought I was there to semi-retire and grow garlic and have goats, um, I ended up having correctional staff showing up on my doorstep for shrink work. And um, correctional staff, families, exes, retirees, and that's when I started getting my education about what corrections can do to a human being. And I used to tell them, boy, you have an invisible tattoo on your forehead that says PTSD. And they say, oh, that's corrections for you. No big deal. And, uh, well, it is and was a big deal. So uh, that's when the call came on my life to do something about it and step up, which was not what I wanted, was not what I had any desire to do, but the call was relentless. So here we are 20 some years later. And um, so we, I founded Desert Waters Correctional Outreach as a 501c3 nonprofit with the aim being the health, sanity, well-being of correctional staff 
of all disciplines and job descriptions and their family members and their agencies where they work because it's really hard to be a healthy a healthy fish in an unhealthy would somebody please take my phone it's very hard to be an, a healthy fish in a in an unhealthy polluted pond so um it's not just for the incarcerated it's also for the staff they're all swimming in the same pool so we set up desert waters correctional outreach to be like water in the desert because it was like a desert, and uh, we were promptly let known that we were not welcome because on the one hand, line staff thought we were spies for administration to find out who was disgruntled and turn them in. And so they they like, stay away from us, and the administrators in some places thought that we were a danger to them because we would cause them lawsuits for PTSD or would empower the unions to ask for more privileges. So both parties said, Go away, little woman. What are you doing here? <laughs> now, who, asked, who are you? What do you know? And of course, I know nothing about corrections other than what I learned from my people that I talked to. And so my whole experience has been based on listening for 22 years and also on, of course, doing the research and listening to the data and listening to the comments people make. So I wanted to take you like through a little walk um, and I put together a handout here with graphics, a little walk about what, what can happen. So let's start with a corrects fatigue process model. And I originated the term corrects fatigue back in the year 2000 when I was trying to appease my conscience about not wanting to get involved in corrections. So I thought, okay, I'll do that for the profession and I'll kind of escape and walk away. But anyhow, what the corrections fatigue is, is really there because the word burnout did not fit. Burnout really in addresses organizational and operational stressors. And operational in corrections would be like running 24-7 oper 24 operations, like shift work, um, of course, the mandatory overtime that we seem to have nationally, uh, equipment issues, uh, plant issues, temperature, locks work, whether they're working or not, all those kinds of things. Organizational stressors are more the interpersonal friction clashes, leadership styles, uh, how promotions get done, how um, investigations get done, how uh, evaluations get done, the people factor. But burnout is missing the aspect of trauma and corrections work is saturated, I mean saturated with exposure to traumatic material either directly in your face, you witness it with your own eyes or hear it in your own ears in real time, or you, or you see somebody else getting affected, which with an incarcerated person or a coworker being attacked, whatever, dying of natural causes in front of you, whatever it might be, or you hear about it, learn about it, see the video later, read the memo, read the files. People are saturated with incredible numbers of exposure to to trauma directly and indirectly. So the word burnout did not capture that. So to me, correct fatigue is the cumulative effect of all those exposures, operational, organizational, and traumatic, like one big pot of stew, and you keep just turning and turning and turning the, the stuff in there and churning them around. And they affect each other, they can aggravate each other, like short staffing, operational stressor will lead to an increased risk of an assault happening, which would lead to, of course, trauma, and then it would lead to kind of staff arguing and blaming each other or their administration or hating whoever attacked them. And then people call off sick because they don't want to go back into that environment or they're mad at somebody. So it keeps going and going and going. And all that impact starts feeding into this hurricane or toilet bowl, whatever you want to look at, at it as, it starts feeding into the person at the individual level. So people start to change. You, you guys talked a lot about change. And so how do they change? We'll start with the negative personality changes. For example, somebody who was gregarious, trusting, friendly, warm and cuddly, become like a wounded grizzly, a prickly, whatever, cactus, and they are very kind of short, irritable, impatient, uh, hostile, rude, mistrusting, reclusive, unfriendly, whatever you want to call it, person, difficult to get along with, 
health starts declining. For one thing, being angry a lot affects our health. So physical health, psychological health, spiritual health, they all go down the toilet. People start developing all kinds of ailments in their 20s, blood pressure meds in their 20s, that they used to be fine and healthy before. They, um, they start becoming more depressed, panic attacks start setting in. Then we, may, we have the post-traumatic symptoms, of course, piling up over time, depression. And of course, all that affects functioning. How could it not? So people are, don't operate well in their community, in their homes. They don't keep up with their responsibilities. They don't keep up with taking care of their dependents. They don't enjoy anymore what they used to enjoy. They, they at work, they start cutting corners, um, don't have breaks in terms of anger. So they lose it with people at work and at home. And as enough people in, on the work, in the workplace have those issues happening, it's become, it becomes a norm. It permeates. It's like a contagious virus. It spreads. And so the whole culture, the whole workforce culture, the whole workplace starts re reeking of that same stench. And it starts looking the same. And so you, a new, new hire walks in the door and they get hit with that negativity, that hopelessness, that darkness, that... Um, callousness, that uh, impatience, that like, I'm not going to talk to you till you prove yourself uh, that you're going to stay, so I'm not going to talk to you for a year. And on and on it goes. And of course it affects the people they manage and supervise. And of course it goes home. Because the same brain is at work as it is when it goes home. They, they, they don't switch their brains off. So the same things affect family, and family becomes the collateral damage. They never signed up for the job, but they did, and they didn't know it. So it keeps spreading and snowballing, and the symptoms of Corex fatigue end up becoming causes because they impact other people, and it snowballs and snowballs and snowballs. So what do we want to be doing? Because Desert Waters was based and founded on the principle of research-based education, and I'm really thankful for... Devin Walker bringing that up, but really that is our focus, research-based education, because I believe information is power, and people need to understand what's going on. They need to have a roadmap. They need to have a roadmap about what's happening to them, about how they've changed, why they've changed. Instead of beating themselves up and hating who they've become, it's like, oh, that's how I ended up there. No wonder. So uh, I'll, I'll go to the third um, in, in graph. The moving forward well, my three wishes. One thing we have been doing, and I've seen a tremendous improvement since 2003 when Desert Taurus was founded to today. It's like night and day in terms of people opening up and accepting. And we're, we're doing a tremendous number of training of instructors in our courses. One of our courses is an award-winning one, the Forum Corrects for to Fulfillment. We have versions for new hires, for seasoned staff, for... Uh, administrators for parole and probation, for juvenile corrections, uh, detention, and juvenile community. Um, we also um, address issues of administrators because they get forgotten in the mix. So there's much, much more of an openness. And yet there's still such a huge need. And eight hours, if you get them, eight hours a year are like a minuscule drop in a huge bucket. You need, we need things that are much more ongoing, much more entrenched, much more part and parcel of how we do corrections. So my three wishes, and if we have time, we'll go to the third um, slide uh, image later. First of all is we have to factor in, into wellness for staff, the effects of constant, continual, ongoing chronic exposure to danger and high stress, and how they affect the brain, how they literally wire our brain at levels that we cannot control voluntarily. So people who feel under threat a lot, and we talk about hypervigilance and corrections all the time, they are in a fight and flight mode way too much. And so as correction styles are changing for good reason, and we are emphasizing more rehabilitation and the fact that we're all human, everybody involved is human, we have to factor in that people are wired to either run in the opposite direction or attack and, and, and suppress the danger, stop the danger from hurting them. 
And it's, it's a very big stressor for staff to, especially when they're chronically, partially sleep deprived. So they're already impaired at that level because we're, they're not doing just a week here and a week there. We're talking about months and years of doing doubles three, four days a week, barely getting four hours of sleep every 24 hours. So we have people that are already running low on juice, extremely low. And then we put them in very high demand environments where they have to be on their toes and respond and have good self-control. Well, we have to factor in how their brain has been wired to be reactive to either squelch danger or get away from it. And this has to be taken into account because people have like not been aware of that and so they have not been including it as oh, this is something that's a reality that may influence the uses of force, may influence how people interact with each other, may influence how even supervisors address their subordinates. Then the next big thing from everything I hear, because remember, I've never worked a day in corrections in my life, but what I hear from staff across the, from the board from all over the country is that we, as the pendulum has swung towards more acknowledgement and understanding of the needs and rights of people who are incarcerated for whatever reason, we need to also keep into account the needs and rights for safety of staff. Because they sort of get in a blind spot. And we forget that if staff are not safe and feel safe and feel taken care of, they are not going to be delivered, delivering what you want them to deliver. There is no way, no way that the mission of an agency for rehabilitation will be accomplished with impaired, broken down, freaked out, paranoid staff. Reactive, totally. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, yeah, I mean, if you have somebody who's ready to pounce on you at the drop of a hat because they're such, so they're, they're, they're threatened all the time, they're not going to be stopping and being empathetic and a good listener. They can't, their brain is in survival mode. So we have to take that into account. They're put in an impossible position to be this self-controlled, mature professional when they are crumbling on the inside and when they feel very, very unsafe and they feel the expression, of course, thrown under the, <laughs> and thrown under the proverbial bus. And, and, and it's not, it's not going to work. We're kidding ourselves if we think that we're going to have good rehabilitation. They're going to check the box, pay lip service, but no, it's not going to really happen. We need to have healthy stuff. The biggest investment an agency can do or anybody who cares about the rights of the incarcerated, the biggest thing they could do in my book is do everything they can to, to keep the staff safe and healthy. Because if you have healthy staff, it's like the tools, a carpenter, a machinist, a mechanic. What do they want? They want good tools. Can a carpenter build, a, I don't know, whatever they build, kitchen cabinets, <laughs> with broken down tools, chipped, broken, cracked, not oiled, whatever. They cannot build a good cabinet for you unless they have good tools. So the staff are the tools through, through which the job gets done. So even if people don't like corrections officers, even if people don't value them, even if people don't want them around, the smartest thing to do would be to have them be healthy because then they can deliver in what you want them to be delivering. So even if you don't like them, please take care of them. The other part is... Um, so it's the smart thing to do. It's smart investment. The other thing is that, of course, it's the moral thing to do, the ethical thing to do. If you send somebody to a toxic spill in their little sandals and shorts, hey, that's not right. They need a hazmat suit. Staff are being thrown in the middle of all kinds of traumatic situations with absolutely no protection. No protection whatsoever. They're just like, deal with it, another day in paradise, and come back tomorrow, and don't complain about being put in the same unit where the floor was covered in blood and you're having nightmares about it. Sorry, you're gonna have to go back there and work there, and it's not my problem, you signed up for this. And they hire at Walmart. And so, um, and so that's how they are treated, and that's how they're talked to, and that bothers me a lot, because that's not right. So we're throwing them in the middle of the the toxic spill and not giving them the hazmat suit. So and we need to. And so how can they take care of things if they are not in, in shape to do so? So what else do we need? We need 
staff wellness programs that are not a check the box. It's not about having somebody with 13 tasks and then you tell them your new tax will be also staff wellness. The, the 14th one is going to be staff wellness. We need to have positions created for staff wellness dedicated. That's their full-time job. And they have policies and procedures backing them up. They have budget line items backing them up. It's not going to go away flavor of the month type with the next administration, the next governor, the next warden. That is going to be here as part and parcel because you cannot run facilities with broken down tools. So you have to have tools in shape. So we need things like preventative measures. And again, thanks, Stefan, for bringing that up. It's so much easier to take care of things than fix something that's broken. An ounce of prevention, right? Breath of panic cure. So trying to do things preventatively, equipping, that's one th of the things we're doing with both families and staff, making them aware of what's coming, what to expect, how to read the roadmap that they're on. And then having also processing capabilities and resources that are correction specific and people understand corrections folks because I've had so many people tell me when I was still doing the therapy piece you're the fourth person I tried and and I'm amazed I even tried I, I was about to give up everybody else could not understand the context of where I'm coming from and they thought I was just a mean spouse when they didn't understand why I would come home in a rage and and so we need correction specific educated therapists and other literature that addresses their issues. And, well, there is, let me look at the third, um, we have a minute and 24 seconds. Th the third um, diagram, we need everybody to do their part. There is no magic bullet. I don't believe in magic bu bullets. That's all fantasy. We need everybody in the system to do its part, their part. And I'm talking now prof the professionals. I'm not talking the incarcerated. They have enough on their plate doing other stuff. I'm talking about the fact that administrators need to set up whatever, the policies, the procedures, the budget line items, and be held accountable to following through and not have it thing things swept under the rug and go away f because of other stressors. They need to do their part. Peers need to do their part, how they treat each other. A lot of times staff tell me my problem is not the incarcerate, my problem is other staff. So it's about how people treat each other and not, not abuse and beat on each other. And then the individual person needs to do their part, which is if you're trained and you get tools, you put them to practice. I don't care if it's one of them only, start doing something. So we need everybody doing their part for us to move forward, otherwise it's going to be jerky little movements here and there and the flavor of the month kind of approach and then we're going to stay in that misery and it's way too many people die every day as you said and um, have lousy life experiences. So thank you very much. Thank you. Let's give all three panelists a round of applause. And I'm going to go to Julie James for the first response from the commission. Thank you all so much for the work you do. You've really dedicated your lives um, to this, and I, I appreciate it so much. Um, we've had a lot of wonderful imagery today that I think helps those of us who haven't carried the keys understand a little bit of what you're going through. I just keep coming back to this, the rain that is just falling on all of us, the secondhand smoke, the toxic pond. And I am angry on your behalf because this isn't a problem that you should have to treat. It's not even a problem that you should try to prevent. Why do we have the system that we have? And I'm angry because of the decisions that were made over decades of policy decisions that um, led to this mass incarceration problem that we have, um, this underinvestment in the treatment and, and the workforce, you know, retention, yes, it's a problem. Underpayment in many places um, is a problem. Um, and it's because it's too much, it's too big. Um, and we are, I think, overdue for a reckoning for that. So I'm carrying that. Um, but what I wanna focus on is something that I've heard as, as a little bit of a theme. I think um, you have power in your stories. 
Um, so thank you for your vulnerability and sharing that. You have power when you're together. Um, and so we've heard a lot uh, about the power of collective action and, and unions. Um, I um, am, am glad at Arnold Ventures that we're able to support some innovative approaches to conditions. And there are a lot of folks in this room who have worked on those things. So there's, there is light, you know, there, there is possibility, but I, I think we have to look at the bigger picture. This, this um, triangle is, is so helpful for, for the system, but who's influencing what that system looks like, what the pond is, and it's policymakers. And you know, some of the work that we do is around advocacy as well. It's not just looking at what's happening inside prisons, but who's making the decisions about that. And so my question to you all, and, and really to any of the, the panelists today, I don't know if I'm allowed to do that, um, but is to say, what do you want policymakers to know about your work? What do you want them to do? Um, because they, they have the power and they're not listening, they're not looking, and so what is it going to take? You're going to have to speak together and loudly with one voice. What do you want them to hear? Well, what I would, like, I would love for people to hear is to hear from the officers about what they need to be safe in the workplace, but, but whether it will be the staffing issues or some policies and procedures. And because un, until they are feeling physically safe, all the other stuff is fluff to them and goes out the window. Thank you. Thanks, Katerina. Thanks, Julie. Um, David Pitts. Sure. Uh, thank you all. I really appreciate all of you offering your, your insights today and all of you. Um, I appreciate the work that you do in your in your day to day careers. I actually want to touch on something that I think is really important and that I hear throughout everything you've said today, which is that we are in the midst of a full on staffing crisis in corrections today. There are not nearly enough people in the workforce to even start to create an environment where people can be healthy, right? And so we've heard that Mrs. Brown's testimony that was read earlier talked about the mandatory overtime. Not only does that create issues with sleep, you're missing children's events the next day, you're making sacrifices uh, on behalf of your family that your family didn't sign up for. And it, it really creates, I think, a rippling effect, right, that continues after that. Um, I talk to wardens in my day-to-day -day work who operate facilities on about 60% of the staffing level they're designed to have. That means that they are using mandatory overtime extensively over the course of their week. And I also talk to wardens that in labor planning have shifts where even if they held over every single person from the shift before, would not have enough people to cover the prison at a minimal level with everyone on lockdown. When everyone's on lockdown, it's not the COs or the incarcerated people that suffer alone. Everybody suffers. No one wants to have that happen. And so what can the wardens actually do? Well, so I hear from them that they are lowering the, in the, the age from 21 to 18. So when you're 18, you can join corrections now. They're offering $1,000 starting bonuses, which is a pittance you know, for what they're trying to get done. Uh, and they're trying to shorten academies in an effort to get bodies into facilities faster. And that goes certainly against everything that we've talked about today with the training. What the wardens can't do is work with pay most of the time. And if I, for example, operated a factory and I couldn't get enough workers to make my product, what would I do? I would increase the cost of the product and pay better wages. But we have legislatures that are involved in setting budgets and legislatures historically have not liked to give money to corrections organizations because it's not always the politically popular thing to do. And so I mention all of this to follow Julie's comments about the decades of policy decisions that have gotten us where we are to say that for those of us who work in policy, counting me, I think it is on us to say to policymakers that investment in the professional careers associated with this line of policy is crucial. People are dying because this is not being uh, compensated properly. And I think until we start to do that, you can't have people who've worked 85 hours be excited about an eight hour wellness training. They, that's the last thing that they wanna do on their week. On their day off. On their day off, <laughs> if they have one. And so I don't have a question for folks so much, it's just to ask that all of us consider how we can play into 
I guess, the advocacy necessary to get resource levels where they need to be so that people who work in prisons are compensated as the professionals they are. And even though we may not get to those ratios that you mentioned earlier or, or you know, get to a two-year academy, I think we have a lot of progress that we can make in getting closer to that. So thank you all again for what you do, and, and I appreciate being here today. Thanks very much, David. <laughs> Brianna, Brianna, I'll send it down to you if you want to. Thank you so much. I have learned a lot today. I'm honored to be able to join and listen to each of you as you share your heart, your stories, um, your experience, and your research. So thank you. Um, kind of building on this theme of the challenge of uh, the, the staffing crisis, um, I wanted to circle back to a question around recruitment. Um, I think it was Mr. Young that said something really insightful to me, which is that we as a society have changed our expectations of our criminal justice systems away from purely a focus on punishment and incapacitation to one that rehabilitates. And yet, um, we're still training and bringing in corrections officers and, and, and professionals under uh, the the incapacitation mindset of decades ago, and we don't have uh, the support systems around them, the training um, to fulfill the new mission of corrections that society is demanding, one of rehabilitation, one of a shared sense of humanity. Um, so I'm curious, from a recruitment perspective, I had the opportunity to spend some time with former director of corrections, Leanne Birch, in North Dakota, and she showed how they were revamping all of their materials. They were rethinking um, what even the profile of uh, an effective corrections professional looks like. Um, and so, it, it, Mr. Larson, perhaps if you could start by commenting on how you guys are thinking about that in Norway in terms of where do you go to find good talent and how are you describing the job, how are you, obviously it needs to match reality, and so I understand there are some challenges there from a funding perspective and, and lots of work to be done in policy change, but how are you thinking creatively about tomorrow's workforce as it relates to the correction space, um, and, and maybe what can we learn from your experience? Yeah, uh, I'll try and answer that question. Uh, what, we, what we did, I think, probably 60 years ago, uh, is that we stopped uh, on the job training and, and we went for a more theoretical and academic training academy. We taught our new uh, officers about what, how, how are these people that are in prisons? What type of people are they? Uh, we gave them tools how to uh, approach them, talk to them. Uh, we also spend a lot of time on, on preparing the uh, future officers on what they will meet when they go out there. Because uh, one of the years at the ed academy is out and doing service in a prison with a mentor. So you're, you're kind of eased into the profession. Uh, and in the recruitment, um, you now do it as, as part of a, a, a degree. So once you've uh, finished the academy and worked for a year or two, then you can apply to take the bachelor's degree. So I, I, I'm not sure if that's the best way to go because it's in, in its heart, it's kind of a practical job. Uh, but you can, if you use the time properly, you can prepare the, the future officers for what they're gonna do. Uh, like I heard a lot of people talking about here today that they, they lack the preparation for what they were signing up for. Uh, so you could do that, but it won't fix everything. Because uh, you have to continue education all the way. Also, because you're not f final, you're not finished with your education when you finish the academy. That's part of your education starts when you finish the academy. Then you have to reamp it. I'll go down to you, Juan Gomez. Yeah, um, I want to say uh, I want to thank everyone here, especially for your service. 
those from the military and those that have had to serve behind those walls as a result of that war on drugs, the war on gangs. Um, I was locked up. I remember uh, Ralph Anderson he ended up moving to Ohio, Idaho. He said, you know, um, the population's changing. I'm going to get out of here before it gets worse. He said, because whatever happened in the 80s, they're starting to talk to us about what's going to happen when you have the children of those who have been addicted to drugs, especially crack, and the mental health conditions we're not going to be prepared for, and they're not going to bring us better training. So I, I say that because one of the biggest, I, I think, um, someone mentioned cognitive dissonance, and what I'm hearing is that there's, there's deep-seated harm, hurt, loss, grief, and there has never been a time to be able to mourn about some of this stuff. We just go back at it. And the trauma and the drama didn't start when you started the first day there. Uh, many of you, many of us, we bring it there. And, and, and that comes home. I had to go to South Carolina a few years ago after one of the worst prison riots since Attica. Seven men lay dead. Many more terrorized, traumatized. They brought that home and they had to get stuck with it. You know, there ain't nobody coming in there. So they said, hey, can you all come in here and help support? Because I hear about the support that are physical and mental, but you cannot forget the relational, the emotional, and the spiritual, which we alluded to. You know, for instance, we come here, right? And we are indigenous land here. We ought to honor our elders, our ancestors, the Piscataway, the Algonquin Pecans people, right? Like, I see that, that, that flag, and it's really a powerful symbol because I see that eagle. I see this one right here. It's a really important bird for us. The highest regard you can get, you get honor. We get decorated, too. You know, so I want to take the time to honor all of you in a good way, in our indigenous way, because we have to, st we have to think something different. This is a baby bald eagle. It, gave, it was given to me in Civic U in Arizona by the White Mountain Apaches. They had, they had to have a fight with the military there just so they can maintain their lands. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the time, right, to step right there and sing a song that came to me. I was in Germany. They took us to an internment camp, and the song came to me right there. It's talking about we got we to gotta call upon our Mother Earth to help heal us. To help work, because this is going to, you need to, in some of these places, I just, I was working in Rikers Island from last July all the way to uh, December. And I'll tell you, you don't want to be incarcerated there. You don't want to work there. It's crazy. It's off the hook. So before they get to, to prison, they're in jail. And it's, it's off the hook over there. So um, like I said, just a moment of silence and think about, you know, all those that came before you. Think about your families. Think about all that. You know, so I'm going to blow this whistle.
you know, thank you for all the work, for all the hardships. You know, I, I think about, you know, the women behind the, those walls who are also serving with their time or working there because I've also had to go into those walls and seen if you see it, say something. The sexual harassment's very pervasive. So, if, you know, if you're working there, don't ever forget that those things need to be also addressed because it's one of the most toxic places for a lot of uh, women and young men to uh, kind of be exposed to, you know. Um, thank you so much. And like I said, I say that much, you know, in the best way, you know, like I say, they are the glory, you know, they are the powerful, you know, they are the ancestors. Thank you, Juan. Thanks very much for that, Juan. Uh, Rob English, send it down to you. Thank you very much for that ritual, that honoring. Uh, sitting here, and I've organized for over 25 years in communities across the country, Baltimore, Cleveland. Um, what came to me, even though I've never carried the keys, is the stories here brought me back to, uh, before I was an organizer, I served in the military. Um, and the, the idea of being behind walls and feeling that you become a monster that was lifted up by Mr. Walker and Mr. Young and the toll that has on your soul. I can relate to that. At the same time, I had a conversation with a returning citizen just last week, and he said the same thing. And he actually used that word monster. And the fact that has on us. And then I think about today with Ms. Mellon and Ms. Kennedy, uh, two daughters, one from an incarcerated family and one from a correctional officer with huge loss. And as I think about that and honor that moment, my question for all of us, maybe for the panel, maybe Mr. Larson from your experience from being afar, is what would it mean for us to have returning citizens' families, returning citizens, correctional staff and officers united in this moment. Because this is a moment, as Simon has says, that we're so polarized, and at the same time on criminal justice, it's one issue that Republicans and Democrats, independents can come together. So Mr. Larson, I don't know if you have some insight into bringing together unusual allies in this fight. I'm not sure how to answer that, actually. Because the Norwegian society is, is, is quite different than the US society. So there's something in our cultural identity that says that everybody needs a new chance. So I, I think it's easier to make a, a transition like that in Norway. Because you're always faced with the, with the question, if you take a look at yourself in the mirror and think about your absolute lowest point, where you were at your worst, would you like that moment to define the rest of your life? I'm betting that none of the men and women that are incarcerated in the US would like to be defined by their worst actions. I think that's probably just like a baseline in Norway for us. Thank you. Uh, David, Fabian. Thank you. Um, so, for those of you who don't know, aside from being a lawyer, I'm a former police officer, and I'm also formerly incarcerated. After listening today, I kind of have come away with three things. Um, first is, I'm reminded today that the job the correction officers do is one part law enforcement officer, one part social worker, one part counselor and mediator, one part mentor, and really fundamentally restorer. And, you know, you all, you know, we, we all hear about the thin blue line uh, you guys are really on the thin blue line because you have this charge of safeguarding, safeguarding communities, safeguarding the people you're charged with overseeing, and safeguarding each other. But the mission there 
um, on the public safety side is equally should be equally focused on rehabilitation and reentry, hopefully redemption, because those parts make every neighborhood safer. Really what I kind of bottom line it that I'm walking away from is the profound policy parallels, ironically, between the life and job of a corrections officer and those that you're charged to oversee. Mental health, the intergenerational cycle of trauma. And I think at the end of the day, challenges you all have are linked, believe it or not, to many policies that we advocate on justice reform. We have too many people incarcerated. We don't have enough resources to make sure that corrections officers have the things that they need. They're more in danger because of overcrowding. Um, if they don't have the tools, as the panelists talked earlier about, to help reform and rehabilitate, what's the purpose of the job? I think that kind of where, is where it all comes down. The real issue, it seems to me, is do we treat the symptoms? With all due respect, mental health care is important, but it's, it's a Band-Aid, as Mr. Walker told me during a break. Or are we treating the problems caused by, by the system? And it, it, it really, again, take a steel line from Mr. Walker, it, it comes down to humanity, it seems to me. Prisons cannot be places where officers or inmates have to check their humanity at the door. Because then it becomes a horrible job that nobody wants to do, and we, it, it's no longer a profession, it's a job. So I, it seems to me that um, we really need to not, we, we have to focus on the symptoms. I, I, I agree with everybody I've heard today. But we really have to focus on the change of culture, the change of mission, so that people who decide to go into this profession, as opposed to as, you know, we've heard the job, are going in there because they're rewarded. They're rewarded economically, they're rewarded spiritually and emotionally, and they have job satisfaction out of it. All you're doing is carrying the keys. I'm not sure that's a great job. And then it, as, as the professor talked about, it becomes a stopover for, for other, other gigs. I'll close this, and I don't have a question, obviously. We're in D.C., the home of the filibuster. <laughs> um, Einstein defined insa insanity as doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting different result. And our bottom line has to be the culture of change which has to focus on rehabilitation, which makes progress on officer safety. Yes, the, the short-term uh, band-aids, as we talked about, are important, but until we transform prisons from human warehouses to places of accountability and rehabilitation, I'm afraid we're gonna continue the insanity going forward. And so my only advice, hope, prayer, wish, is that everybody in this room starts to echo the messages that we've heard today, not to each other, because that's a little bit of preaching to the choir, but to the people that actually set budgets, make the rules, decide who does and doesn't have to go to prison and for how long. Uh, those are the critical tools of change, and I think it's so good, so healthy, um, for you all, and you know, kudos to you, you Simon and Andy, to bring this diverse group together because we got to stop talking to ourselves, and we got to start start talking to those crazy people up the street and in every state capital around the country. Thanks, David. Uh, Nico, I'll hand you the mic. Thank you. I'm going to warn you now, Simon, I'm probably going to go over my time because <clears throat> I've been sitting here holding in a lot. I, I apologize. Um, but I, like my, my fellow commissioners, I want to thank everyone who has provided testimony here today. It has been incredibly moving and powerful. Um, but I, I have some comments that I prepared that I, I want to share 
But before I do that, I also want to respond to the um, panelists who just spoke with us and um, not offer a question, but uh, just a mere comment for something that I feel like we need to bring into this room and to think about. But um, Mr. Larson, you, you said something that, uh, you said a lot that resonated with me, but one thing was the question that you asked yourselves in Norway, the two questions that you asked, what led to this and why are we here? And I was struck by that because the reality in this country is that we have to have a conversation about how racism has gotten us to the point where we are today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This system that we have in this country of mass incarceration is rooted in a fear of black and brown people. And I heard the gasp in the room as Mr. Larson, you said that the staffing ratio was 1.1 staff members to one person incarcerated. And I've heard many comments here today about how we need to recruit more staff and what we can do to recruit more staff. And I respect those comments, but I also challenge all of us and everyone listening today to think about how we uh, dispel that fear of racism and the people who are incarcerated in these facilities and to think about how we can decarcerate more people. It's not just about hiring more staff, but it's about reducing the number of people who are negatively impacted by this system. And so that is my challenge to all of us today to think about the power that we have in this room to really champion decarceration as a part of this effort. Now, I also wanted to um, share that it was really early in my training as a clinical psychologist that I knew I wanted to specialize in correctional mental health. It was because of my life experiences, which I won't bother to go into now because Simon will nudge me, um, <laughs> but that I knew that I wanted to go into this field because there were people leaving these systems that were broken and that was the people who were incarcerated. And I knew that was my purpose to support them in one of the lowest moments that I felt that they had endured. And it was in my first week working at Cook County Jail in Chicago, where I was greeted by a bubbly sergeant. And uh, his, his laughter was boisterous. His personality was larger than life. He was my go-to guy. Anything I needed, he did. His, he would often say, anything you need, doc. That was our, our banter back and forth. And one Friday morning, May 1st, 2009, my go-to guy was no longer here. He had died by suicide. Now, he was not the first nor the last officer friend I lost, sadly. And it was in that moment that I knew my purpose was expanded to not just help the people who were leaving the institution who had been confined that was broken. Oh, I'm going way over, Simon. <laughs> but also to help the staff who were leaving the institution and were also broken. And so when I made warden in May of 2015, that was my focus, to support the people who were incarcerated and to support the staff, to think about the programs and the policies that we could change to make wellness essential but to also bring light into a dark facility. We were only able to do that by working with our staff and by working with the people who were incarcerated and by working with the community. Someone spoke about the power in having allies and that was the power that we were able to bring to life. And because of that, we were able to reduce the population at Cook County Jail by more than 20%. Staff began to feel safer. It's nowhere near what it needs to be because it's still a dark correctional institution, like every correctional institution in this country. I left that system in May of 2018 because I, as an administrator, was broken. And I realized that
that the system wasn't just breaking people incarcerated and it wasn't just breaking staff, it was also breaking administrators. Everyone who comes into contact with that system is devastated by it. And it was in my current role as the managing director of justice initiatives at an organization called Chicago Beyond. We're an impact investor fighting for justice. It's in this role that I have been able to take all of those cumulative experiences and to work with all of those groups, current and former correctional leaders, current and former correctional staff, people who are incarcerated and people who have been incarcerated and community members and to say we have to invoke change. We can no longer sit on the sidelines. We just recently published Do I Have the Right to Feel Safe? And I ask that each of you go to our website, chicagobeyond.org, and download this publication because it was written with Andy Potter, Simon Greer, Corey Post, and the whole One Voice United team. But it was also written with Just Leadership USA and many people who have been incarcerated in this system. And it was written with people who have been survivors of crime, the people that we say this system is supposed to protect, but it doesn't. And it was written with families who have been impacted by incarceration. Together, we can change this system. We all have the right for holistic safety. That's creating communities where we all feel protected and whole and resilient. But it's going to take all of us to unite and have some of those difficult conversations and to realize that even though we come from divergent pathways, we all want the same thing, to be safe and to be well. And together we can do that. A very well used two minutes. <laughs> um, Rabbi Jonah Pesner will finish it up with you. Thank you, Simon and uh, Andy, and thank you to everybody. As we come towards the final moments that we're going to share together today, let's take a collective deep breath. Take a moment and look around the room in the sacred assembly because our time here is coming short, but the sanctity of these moments we have shared and the stories we have heard need to stay with us and inspire us as we go forth on our journey. It's recorded in Hebrew scripture that my ancestors, the children of Israel, the Hebrew slaves, cried out in a collective lament, and it was then that God heard their cries and began the process of redemption, the transformation of a people in a box, trapped and suffocating, having been stripped of their humanity, to be transformed into a people that could be free and breathe. Today we have heard that collective cry, the lament of the families, the families of the officers and the staff, the women and the men who toil in the box, the families of incarcerated people who live and die in the box. We are taught in Ezekiel, God says, as surely as I live, it is not the death of someone who has done wrong that I seek, but rather that she or he return <laughs> and live. So forgive us, God, because your children are dying. The officers and the staff and the people who are trapped in the box are dying. And that, as surely as you live, O oh God, is the sin. So challenge us, inspire us, and guide us, O oh God, as we go forth on our journey 
to realize that correction, in your ancient language, tikkun, tikkun means repair, return, and heal. May we litaken olam b'malchut shaddai. May we repair all that is broken here on earth so that our world will be like the heavenly kingdom above, a place of love and life and mercy for all your children. Amen. Thank you all for joining us for what we promised was the first ever Blue Ribbon Commission on Correctional Wellness.